Everyone in the classroom sat awkwardly in silence, and the teachers looked like they wished they were somewhere else. At first, they had thought this was a minor squabble, but Madison's serious demeanor was making them think twice. No matter whether or not her accusation was true, they were going to have to investigate. After all, in their industry, someone's designed for their lifeblood. Taking credit for someone else's work was highly unacceptable and could derail a career. The atmosphere in the class was growing tenser. Madison stood behind her desk and glared at Meg, who was still standing behind the podium, glaring right back at her. Allie decided to stand up and speak. Professors, Madison and I discussed this presentation before, and she showed me her work. It was the same as this advertisement, she announced. While Madison's less than stellar reputation had followed her in school, Allie was very well liked and respected by both her peers and her teachers. They thought she was hardworking, smart, and an overall good person. Her words carried more weight than Madison's, so after she spoke, the teachers turned to Meg with suspicion in their eyes. Madison also had experience working outside of school, while Meg didn't. That spoke volumes about her character and work ethic, even with the rumors surrounding her. When Meg saw the professor's suspicion, she shook her head angrily and snapped, Madison, don't be ridiculous. I made this video myself. You can't say I stole your work just because both of our projects are about perfume. That's a really serious accusation. On the projector, the scene was still fixed on the last scene of the ad which showed colorful butterflies, pink calligraphy, and soft lighting. This was Madison's signature style, and anyone familiar with her work would recognize it immediately. Even though the teachers were starting to believe her accusation, every inch of her body was still filled with anger about the theft. However, when she heard what Meg had said, she couldn't stop herself from laughing as she responded, Meg! You know where this advertisement came from, and it wasn't through your hard work. I'm not going to let you get away with this. Throughout her life, there were two things that she had always hated. One was when people believed others were beneath them, and the other was when people cheated. Fuming, she thought, I don't know what her end game is here, but this won't work out well for her. Meg's face blushed red with fury as she challenged, don't pick a fight you can't win, Madison. Your well-connected older brother can't help you with this. I'm the only one who made this video. Kate and Leah even saw me make it. How dare you say I stole from you? I should be accusing you of stealing from me. With that, the three teachers looked troubled, knowing this wouldn't be an easy matter to settle. They had no choice but to send Allie over to fetch Professor Matthew Becker, the director of the design department. While she was gone, Madison remained standing, and her small hands clenched into fists as she continued to glare at Meg. However, her brain was working overtime. How could Meg have gotten her hands on my work? She wondered anxiously. I showed it to Allie when it was finished, but she would never betray me like that. Who would have been able to steal it from my computer? She continued to think. Even before the director arrived, she knew that continuing to argue with Meg wouldn't help her at all. She needed to think of a way to prove that the advertisement was hers. Her rival seemed to understand that as well, and she stood in silence too. A few minutes after she had left, Allie walked back in with Professor Becker, who had a very serious look on his face. He huffed in annoyance before gruffly saying in a raised voice, You two, come to my office immediately. You're both going to explain yourself so we can get to the bottom of this. Madison nodded in agreement and quickly gathered her things so she could follow the director back to his office. Allie, however, was worried for her friend and turned around to look for Jason. He was Professor Becker's favorite student, so she hoped he could help Madison, but she didn't see him. News of the incident between Madison and Meg quickly spread across campus. When Jason heard what was happening, he headed over to the classroom, where Allie happened to find him. She led him over to the department director's office, 
explain the situation on the way. Kate and Leah clearly had the same idea, since they were waiting in the office to support Meg's side of the story. In that short period, Madison had managed to mostly get her emotions under control, but her anger was still simmering under the surface. I don't know who gave Meg my project, but I'm going to destroy them, she thought. After five years of suffering, her reputation had finally taken a turn for the better. Between what she had said at Kelsey's engagement party and the whole ordeal at the clinic, she had done everything she could think of to restore her public image. But now, after all that, Meg is trying to mar my reputation again. If news of my committing plagiarism gets out, I'll be ruined. I'll never be able to get a job if that happens, and everyone will think I'm a cheater, she thought worriedly. She felt her heart constrict when her thoughts drifted to Ian. She had worked so hard to be the type of person he deserved to marry. But even after going to such great lengths, she might end up in the same place where she started. The Westons are finally starting to accept me. Will they still welcome me into the family if they think I tried to graduate college by cheating? She wondered. Whoever did this to Madison might not have known all the details of her marriage and in-laws, but they had created a huge hurdle for her nonetheless. I don't know why so many people seem to be against me when I'm just living my life. I suppose I'll have to live as well as possible to show them that their efforts failed, she thought sadly. With that, she was even more determined to clear her name. She faced the director, who was standing behind his desk, as she heard people arrive outside. While she assumed both her friends and Meg were there, from how loud the commotion was, it seemed like even more people were gathering in the waiting area. She heard the receptionist raise her voice in annoyance, and assumed people were trying to get close for the best gossip. A minute later, the door opened, letting Allie, Jason, Kate, and Leah step inside. The students in the waiting room all craned their necks to try and see what was going on. All right, you two, the director said with a huff, sinking into his desk chair. The professor had followed them into the office and now stood behind Professor Becker. One at a time, explain to me what happened today. If we can't get to the bottom of this, neither of you will get credit for the project. Meg didn't hesitate to step forward and start speaking, not bothering to wait and see if the director was going to pick one of them to go first. With an aggrieved look on her face, she complained, Sir, I was in the middle of my presentation when Madison suddenly stood up and said that my advertisement was actually hers. This is the first time I've heard anything about this. I made this video completely on my own. I don't know why she would try to accuse me of such a thing. When she finished speaking, she turned to look at the other women with disgust. Madison, however, smiled coldly at her rival. Looking Meg square in the eye, she said, Good. If you made the advertisement yourself, you can tell us how. I'm sure you'll have no trouble detailing the creative process you went through, as well as any problems you encountered in the design and execution. That will be easy, if you did actually do the work yourself, at least. She broke eye contact with Meg as she turned to the professor, saying, I don't believe that any decent designer would allow their work to be so similar to anyone else's either. The video she presented uses elements of my signature style. Why would she have designed a project that she knew would closely resemble anything I made? As she listened to Madison speak, Meg started to look nervous, but she forced herself to say, Fine. We'll discuss the process I went through. I'll prove this was my work. Madison's only response was to quirk an eyebrow, clearly doubtful that Meg would be able to do that. After both women had said their piece, the teachers pulled up both advertisements on the computer to inspect them. No matter how they looked at it, the video looked the same. One student had clearly stolen the other's work. The teacher and their director all agreed that the advertisement was very well executed. It was edited cleanly, the branding wasn't over the top, and the product was highlighted well. They would have expected this level of work to be a professional advertisement, rather than just a final college project. 
However, that didn't help them figure out which of the students had plagiarized it. At that point, Professor Becker felt a headache growing. He looked over the project once more, trying to think of how to solve the issue. How am I supposed to figure out who made this? He wondered. They're the same. With a heavy sigh, he said, Well, tell me about the design process. Madison turned to Meg and gave her a challenging look. She intended to let the other woman speak first, since she had not actually created the project and would likely give herself away. Meg looked right back at her, an angry expression on her face as well. Unbeknownst to Madison, the woman was actually jealous of her. She thought, Everyone always pays Madison so much attention. Even though she's married now, she's still the only one Jason will look at. He thinks she's so talented. Well, I guess what we'll see what he thinks of her after this. She'll be nothing but a liar and a cheater to him. She'd always hated Madison, and now she was determined to ruin the woman's reputation once and for all. The situation came to a standstill as Madison and Meg glared at each other, each refusing to speak first. At that point, Kate stepped forward and declared, Madison, this isn't like you. I heard you just got married. I don't know if you're having relationship problems or something, but you can't take that out on Meg. I know you're talented, but so is she. You can't accuse her of stealing your work just because her advertisement is so well done. I don't know why you're doing this, but could you please just tell the truth? Leah took a step forward as well, nodding as she agreed. That's right, professors. I can't even tell you how many times Meg stayed up all night working on this. She never thought it was good enough and made countless little changes to improve it. After it was done, she showed it to Kate and me. Are you really going to let her hard work go to waste? And believe this accusation with no proof? Not so fast, Leah, Allie interjected. Sure, Meg's work is usually good, but it's not to this level. Based on her previous designs, I don't think there's any way she could have made something of this quality. Although her voice was soft, she spoke with confidence as she defended her friend. She turned to look at the professors as she continued, Madison completed this assignment just three days ago. You have to know that she put her heart and soul into this work. She went out and hired the model for the advertisement herself. With that, the teacher straightened up, realizing that they had a solution if Madison could prove she had been the one to hire the model. Not only had she scouted out the model, but Zach had secured the site where she had filmed the video, and he had helped her hire a professional cameraman. While the school had a photographer available for the students, her brother had wanted her to have every advantage possible. Unfortunately, Madison didn't have any proof of that, since Zach had been the one to hire him. It would have been difficult to prove he had been the one to film the advertisement anyway. The director seemed to have reached the same conclusion. He eagerly turned to Madison and asked, Can you get hold of the model and have her vouch for you? Since it had been filmed in a hotel bathroom, the most distinctive and recognizable part of the advertisement was the model. If she could verify that Madison had been the one to hire her, the matter would be settled easily. Allie looked over at her friend with anticipation, and Jason was so nervous that he almost held his breath. Madison, on the other hand, frowned helplessly as she looked at the others in the room. It was unlikely that Meg would have known this, but Madison wasn't able to contact the model anymore. She hesitantly admitted, I'm sorry, but I can't. The model I hired is Rushton, and she's no longer in the country. Not long after we filmed the video, her work visa expired and she had to go home. Her old phone number doesn't work, so I'm not sure how to get in touch with her. That statement caused a smug look to come over Meg's face. Her lips curled into a smirk as she suggested, Well, if you don't have a way to prove your accusation... Maybe you shouldn't have said anything. You made this advertisement. Why are you struggling to find evidence? You didn't even mention that this was obviously filmed in the Pink Star Hotel. Madison had originally wanted to point that out, 
But she hadn't been sure if it would help her. If she said anything about the filming location now, however, everyone would think she was trying to co-opt the information Meg had shared. She felt her anxiety growing, and she realized she had no idea how to prove her case. What do I do? She wondered. What would Ian do? As her thoughts landed on Ian, his face appeared in her mind, and she felt some of her worries fade away. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath to steady herself. When she opened her eyes again, there was no trace of anxiety there, and she calmly looked at Kate, Leah, and Meg as she declared, I will say this one last time. That advertisement is mine. I spent three whole months painstakingly making every little part of it. I came up with the idea. I designed the outline of the video, and I was the one who chose the model and filming location. If you want to claim it as your own, then so be it. Everyone in the office went silent when she said that. That was the last thing they had expected from her. However, after a brief pause, she continued, If you insist on taking credit for this, then I'll see you in court. Even if I can't convince everyone here, I won't let you get away with marring my reputation. If you don't admit the truth, I'll sue you for defamation of character and theft of intellectual property. Allie's eyebrows shot up, and she looked over at her friend in alarm. She whispered, Madison, as she reached out and grabbed her hand. Madison gave her a reassuring look. Then she looked at the director and announced, Professor Becker, I'm going to call my lawyer if we can't get to the bottom of this. I'm sure he'll be able to resolve the situation. The director and the other teachers were all shocked by her announcement. Jason frowned deeply and said, Madison, I don't know how easy this will be to deal with in court. Are you sure that's the best idea? Madison didn't respond as she kept staring down the director, who was having a bit of a crisis. She can't bring her a lawyer here. If she does, this whole thing could turn into a media crisis, and the school's name will be dragged through the mud, the director thought. Miss Greenwald, are you sure that's an appropriate course of action? He nervously asked. Meg was also shocked by Madison's statement, and her face turned pale. While she stood in silence, Leah pinched her to bring her back to her senses. Kate recovered the fastest and said, Don't think that hiring a lawyer will intimidate us. Going to court won't change the fact that this advertisement belongs to Meg. Madison smiled, shrugging at their response as she resigned herself to the course of action. Coincidentally, right as she reached for her phone, it started to ring. Startled, she didn't bother to look at the screen before she handed it to Allie who quickly took it and went out into the waiting room to answer. That's right, Leah added, her face full of indignation. Do you think that your lawyer can cover up the truth? You know, I wonder if this is even the first time you've pulled a stunt like this. Did you use your brother's connections to steal other work you presented as your own? Were all your projects plagiarized? Meg's worry started to fade away as she assumed that Madison wouldn't dare to actually take her to court. She thought, even if she won the case, everyone would hear about it, and she'd never be able to get rid of the rumors. She raised her chin and insisted, Madison, I know you don't like me, but I'm still a student who got into this school based on my abilities. I think all the teachers understand that this advertisement is mine. I won't let you get away with this. Even if you take me to court, I won't back down. Neither will I, Madison yelled in response, shocking everyone present. She looked straight at her rival and said, Meg, neither of us will give up, so we'll go to court and explain the matter. If you're right, you'll have no issue telling them this is your work. Then, we'll get to the truth of the matter. The director looked back and forth between the two of them as they argued, feeling himself getting more frustrated. Finally, he couldn't stand it anymore. He slammed his hands down on his desk as he stood up and yelled, Enough, both of you. Madison, if you want to call your lawyer, then go ahead. If you want to ruin your public image to fight this out, then go for it. He paused for a moment to be sure his words were sinking in before he added, If you choose to go down that route, however... 
Neither of you can continue your education here. I won't see this school's reputation being brought into disrepute over such a ridiculous matter. Both Madison and Meg were shocked at the director's reaction. He was serious, and he clearly meant his threat. If the situation couldn't be resolved that day, neither of them would be able to graduate. After a moment, a satisfied look came over Meg's face. Putting her hands on her hips, she declared, Well then, it's time for you to admit the truth. You're the one who's trying to steal someone else's work. I can very clearly tell you about my design concept. I even told you where the advertisement was filmed, but you still insist on saying that this is actually yours? Are you really that shameless? As she spoke, she subconsciously glanced at Jason, who was still standing behind Madison. I know that everyone thinks you're more talented than me, but that doesn't mean you can steal my project. This advertisement is mine, and I won't let you take credit for my hard work. If you really want to take me to court, then fine. I'm not afraid of you. I might not have as many family connections as you do, but that doesn't mean I'm going to let you push me around. Madison rolled her eyes and smirked, unable to keep her emotions off her face. The only reason Meg isn't afraid is that she thinks I won't actually sue her, she thought. She turned to the director and explained softly, Professor, I know that you don't want the reputation of this school to be tarnished. However, I'm not going to let this matter lie. I worked hard on this advertisement, and I'm not going to back down and let someone else get credit for it. I won't rest until this matter is resolved. The dean was furious at that, and he stared at his students until his face turned red. He had a duty to protect the school, but he was also nervous about angering Madison's family. He knew her brother had connections to many important people, and he had no idea what would happen if he did actually prevent her from graduating. <laughs> Professor Becker was furious with Madison. He cautioned her through gritted teeth. Madison, don't make things worse. If you pursue this, I don't think it will end well for you, or your brother, for that matter. This will hurt his reputation, too, you know. Madison let out a self-deprecating laugh. Of course he's trying to get me to drop it, but does he think I'm stupid? If I don't defend myself and get accused of plagiarism, that will hurt my brother just as much, she thought. She gave the director an unimpressed look as she responded, I'm sure my brother will support me in this matter. Professor Becker let out an angry growl before he shouted, I've had enough. I already said that if you pursue this in court, you'll both be done at this school, and I meant it. You think I won't follow through on my threat just because you're about to graduate? No, I've decided that neither of you will get credit for this work. You'll both start over. You'll complete a new advertisement and have it ready to present in three weeks. That's my final decision. Meg gasped at his statement and Madison felt her stomach drop. While the decision seemed fair on the surface, it had taken her months to complete that project. There was no way she could produce anything of the same quality in three weeks. Not to mention that she was telling the truth, and now had to start over because another student had decided to cheat. I'm being punished for something I didn't even do, she thought in despair. At that moment, just as she lost her last bit of hope, there was a knock on the office door. Startled, everyone looked over toward the sound. After a second, Madison lowered her head, frustrated that there would be more witnesses to her failure. However, when the door opened, Allie walked in with Ian close behind her. He had on a white button-up shirt, which was tucked into a pair of black casual pants. His shirt sleeves were rolled up, revealing his strong forearms. Even though he was dressed simply, his presence made quite an impact when he walked in and announced, Sorry to interrupt, I'm here to pick up Madison. At the sound of his voice, Madison's head shot up in surprise, and she felt complicated emotions wearing with each other. While she was happy to see her husband, she was frustrated that he was about to witness her humiliation once again. What will he think of me now? She wondered sadly. Ian lingered in the doorway and looked over at Madison. 
who was next to the director's ornate desk. His eyes lit up as he thought, She looks beautiful today. After a moment, he came forward to stand next to his wife and asked, Is she able to leave now? No one responded to his question. The teachers were all looking at each other, unsure how to react. Kate's eyes were appreciatively wandering over Ian's frame, and she felt her heart beating faster. Even Leah had started to blush when he came in. Madison noticed that Ian didn't close the door when he came in, and she saw a group of students lingering in the waiting area. She wasn't sure if it would help to close the door at that point. However, the damage was already done. Kate saw Ian reach out to place his hand on Madison's waist, and when he was about to lead his wife away, she blurted out, Wait a minute. Your wife can't leave just yet. He stole my friend's advertisement and was just confessing to what she did. When she finished, Kate looked around with a smug face. Meg relaxed, thinking that this debacle would hurt Madison's relationship. She happily glanced at the open door and assumed that everyone in the waiting area would believe Kate's accusations and think Madison was a cheater. Kate, you're a liar, Madison said angrily, glaring at Kate as she felt her anger rising again. That's not what happened, and you have no evidence that the video belongs to Meg. I've been very clear. That advertisement is mine. I planned it out. I hired the model and watched the cameraman record it. I edit it together. It's the result of my hard work, not hers. Unfortunately, Meg's assumption had been right, and the nosy onlookers had heard every word. By the end of Madison's little speech, they had already started chatting among themselves about the situation. Isn't that the advertisement Meg presented? Is it supposed to be Madison? There have been so many rumors about Madison, who knows whether she's telling the truth or not. She's so talented, though. It might really be hers. Are you joking? She only seems talented because of her family. But they got her a bunch of help, and she didn't actually do any of the work. Yeah, they just don't want everyone to know their daughter is an idiot. Madison stiffened defensively when she heard what they were all saying about her. Suddenly... She felt her husband's large, warm hand encompass her, and she felt reassured. Ian stood beside her as he quietly glanced at the people in the room. He then looked at Meg and asked, You said the advertisement was yours? Meg straightened up and looked proud, assuming that Ian was just a doctor and, therefore, wouldn't do anything to influence the situation. She nodded and agreed. Yeah, I'm the one that made the advertisement. And Madison stole my work. Now she's shamelessly trying to claim that I'm the one who stole it from her. She even threatened to use her family connections to ruin me. How could she do something like that? Meg, that's what you say, Allie warned angrily, her body rigid with tension. This matter hasn't been resolved yet. Madison can still sue you for slander. It's not up to you to decide how this is settled, she added. Ian didn't bother to participate in the argument. Instead, he turned to Madison and asked, What do you want to do about this? Madison lifted her chin and asserted firmly, I'm determined to investigate and figure out how this happened. I'm not going to let her ruin my life over this. If she couldn't prove that Meg had stolen her work, everyone would assume Madison was lying. Then her reputation would be tarnished again and the Weptons would be unwilling to accept her. To make matters worse, she would never be respected in the advertising industry and would never get hired. Her marriage and career would both be over before they ever really started. Ian squeezed her hand and gave her a soft smile. He took out his phone and made a call. After a few moments, someone answered, and he said, Yes, Morgan Miller and Davis? This is Dr. Weston. I need you to send Mr. Davis here right away to deal with a case of intellectual property theft. After Ian gave them the address and hung up the phone, everyone was silent. They all understood what was about to happen. Meg's mouth had dropped open, and she swayed a little in shock. Professor Becker sputtered in indignation for a minute before he managed to say, Who do you think you are? How dare you barge in here and decide how I settle matters in my department? You need to get the hell out of my office. 
This was the first time any of them had seen the director get so angry. Allie lowered her head to hide her nervous smile, while Jason looked at Ian in disbelief and asked, Do you know what kind of trouble this will cause Madison? It might make you feel better to act like this now, but it could come back to bite her later. He knew that if the situation was not handled properly, the rumors would last forever. Then Madison's career would be ruined, and her public image might never recover. Even if you're her husband, you shouldn't make this decision for her. If you're unfamiliar with this industry, you could make matters worse. Madison is a person with her thoughts and feelings, and she's perfectly capable of handling this. You should take a step back before you cause this to blow up in her face, Jason interjected. Ian turned to Jason as the man spoke and gave him an unimpressed look. He raised an eyebrow and queried, Do you know my wife well enough to be sure of that? You may not be able to help her with this, but that doesn't mean everyone else is that useless. While Ian knew he should be more polite to Madison's friends, he wasn't happy with how Jason was acting with his wife. He had only been in the room for a few minutes and could already tell the man was in love with her. Madison seemed to be shocked by Ian's response, and she looked up at him, her brows furrowed in concern. The atmosphere was tense and uncomfortable while they waited for Ian's lawyer. Luckily, he was very efficient and arrived only ten minutes later. When he entered the waiting area, the remaining onlookers started to chatter excitedly. Mr. Davis came in and calmly spoke to Madison and listened as she explained the situation. After that, he watched the advertisements carefully. Then he straightened up and said, Miss Greenwald, we can certainly resolve this. However, it would be a great help if the model would make a statement to support you. Could you get in touch with her? Madison shook her head, knowing there was nothing she could do on that front. Even if she could track the model down, it would take quite a while. By the time she got a statement from the woman, her graduation would have passed. Ian was standing by the desk, and he saw his lawyer watching the advertisement. While he had seen plenty of ads before, he had never paid much attention to them. Now, however, as he saw his wife's work, he felt proud and impressed. He had never expected Madison to be so talented. No wonder this other woman is trying to take her down. I'm sure there are many more students that are jealous of her skill, he thought. When he saw Madison shake her head, Ian asked softly, Do you have any idea how to find her? She shook her head again and replied, She's from Russia, and she used a temporary phone number while she was here. When her work visa expired and she had to go home, she didn't leave me a way to get in touch with her. She sighed before she added, I would have never gotten in touch with her the first time if Zach hadn't helped me. He's the one who helped me find her. Ian narrowed his eyes at that and paused as he thought for a moment. He then took out his phone and called Zach, asking him for details about the model they had hired. He didn't mention anything about the situation at the school, instead focusing on getting as much information as possible. I don't care if she's in Russia, I need to find her, he shouted. Meg watched the situation unfold, looking more self-righteous with every word Ian said. She was confident that they wouldn't be able to find the model. Using the situation to further her case, she looked at Madison sadly and asked, Are you really going to keep up this farce in front of your husband? Enough is enough. I told you that I shot the advertisement in the Pink Star Hotel. You keep saying I stole it from you, but you have no proof. You can't even find the model you supposedly used. It's a joke to you. You can't just steal work from people because you have money. I'm going to reveal your true colors for everyone to see today. Madison took a deep breath to keep her temper under control. She was serious about the situation, but she knew throwing a fit would only make her look worse. When she was finally calm enough, she replied, Don't be so sure how this will end. We're still investigating this. I'm not going to stop until everyone knows what you did. When Ian heard what his wife said, he couldn't help but smile. He wasn't worried about someone like Meg. After getting all the information he could from Zack, 
Ian made another call. Besides Madison, no one knew who he was or the connections he had. They all assumed he was just an ordinary person trying to help his wife. They have no idea who they're dealing with, she thought. After looking at the advertisements again, the lawyer came forward. He leaned in so he could whisper to Ian without the teachers or students hearing and murmured, Mr. Watson, while I will take the case, it'll be very difficult to win without proper evidence or witnesses. Ian nodded to indicate that he understood. Then his lips twitched into a smirk and he said, Don't worry, I found a witness. You can talk to him yourself. After saying that, he lowered his phone and switched the call over to a video chat. He turned so everyone in the room could see his screen, showing a man in a black uniform who was around 30 years old. The logo on his shirt and the decor behind him revealed that he was an employee at the Pink Star Hotel. The man waved in greeting and introduced himself. Hello, I'm Paul Campbell, the general manager of the Pink Star Hotel. Dr. Weston told me you needed our help so I rounded up the staff who were on shift when the commercial was being filmed. Meg's face had twisted into something ugly the moment she saw who was on the phone. Kate saw her friend's reaction and demanded, Why should we believe you? The Greenwald family has so much money, they could have bribed you to support their daughter. Mr. Campbell's face was very serious as he answered, It seems this young lady is unfamiliar with how we do business. We've hosted guests with much more money, fame, and notoriety than the Greenwald, but no one has ever been allowed to film a scene in our hotel. We made an exception for Miss Greenwald because her brother and his friend Daniel Weston explained what the video was for and assured me that it would not be released publicly. It is impossible to work in this hotel without my permission, and I would have never allowed anyone else to film here. Everyone present felt a slight chill when they heard the manager's explanation. Even the director, who had been red with fury a few minutes ago, sat back in his chair with a blank look on his face. No one knew much about the background of the Pink Star Hotel, besides the fact that it had some kind of relationship with the Phantom. This was the first time they learned how strict the hotel was. Even Madison hadn't known that being allowed to film at that hotel had been so significant. All she knew was that her brother had helped her secure the best location possible for her video. Of course, Leah, Kate, and Meg were also learning about this for the first time. Meg was frozen as the severity of the situation started to sink in, and Leah and Kate started to inch away from their friends, as though physically separating from her would keep them out of trouble. Mr. Campbell didn't seem to notice everyone's reactions as he continued, as I said, Miss Greenwald is the only person who has ever filmed an advertisement in the Pink Star Hotel. I gathered the staff who were on shift that day, in case you have questions or need to hear their accounts as well. As he spoke, he turned his phone to show a few staff members waiting patiently behind him. Mr. Davis quickly pulled out a legal pad, leaned on the director's desk, and started to fervently write down some notes. A minute later, he looked back up toward the phone and asked, Do you remember seeing someone come to film an advertisement that day? The staff members nodded, and one spoke up to say, Yes, sir, it was Miss Greenwald. She's the one standing next to Dr. Weston now. After that statement, Meg let out a pained noise and stumbled into a nearby chair. She had never imagined her plan would backfire this way. The only reason she had dared to mention the Pink Star Hotel was because of how famous it was. She had hoped that name-dropping the hotel would cause the teachers to believe her case, and she had never expected anyone to dare to call and ask questions. Most people would have been terrified to risk their standing at such an exclusive place. The lawyer continued to question the staff, gathering their statements and contact information. Ian exchanged phones with his lawyer, and made another call. Madison was close enough to see that he had dialed an international number. She looked up at her husband with astonishment and gratitude as he waited for his call to be answered. Is he calling a Russian number? I can't believe he's doing this all for me. I really owe him everything. If it wasn't for him, 
My reputation would still be in ruins, and I'd be stuck with Drake, she thought. A few moments later, the call went through, which happened to be right when Mr. Davis had finished gathering the evidence. Everyone could hear Ian speaking in clear Russian, and they stared at him in disbelief. Ian didn't say anything for a minute, and since the call was on speakerphone, a female voice could be heard. Then he said something else in Russian, before switching the call to video mode. When he turned the phone, so everyone could see it, they all recognized the blonde woman on the other end. It was the model from the advertisement. Ian looked around and asked, Does anyone else speak Russian? They all glanced at each other, hoping someone would be able to help. Unexpectedly, Jason stepped forward and said, Yes, I do. Madison turned to look at him in surprise, though she didn't say anything as Ian handed him the phone. He spoke to the model for a few minutes, translating what the model was saying every so often. Eventually, he asked, Is the designer of the advertisement here? Do you remember who it was? He then repeated himself in Russian, and when she responded, he pointed to Madison, causing her to nod enthusiastically in response. He turned to everyone else and told them, She says Madison is the person she worked with. Ian took back the phone and spoke to her for a moment before hanging up. Then he quietly took Madison's hand and stood there calmly as if he was a bystander, not the one who had orchestrated the whole situation. Everyone present had a good opinion of Jason, as he was likable, hardworking, and honest. So after he announced that the model had recognized Madison, Everyone's eyes turned to Meg. Her face was pale. Her hands were shaking, and her eyes were darting around frantically, as though she was looking for a familiar face. However, even her friends had moved away from her, and looked like they desperately wanted to flee the room. She sputtered for a moment before she was able to say, Madison, I'm so sorry, this isn't... I didn't... It wasn't on purpose. Madison rolled her eyes and turned away from Meg. As if I'm supposed to feel sympathy for her. If Ian hadn't found the hotel manager and the model, everyone would have believed her. My career would have been ruined, she thought. After a minute, she looked back over at Meg and asked softly, I only want to know one thing. Who gave my advertisement to you? With that, everyone fell silent, eagerly awaiting the answer. Meg opened up her mouth and quickly closed it again with a panicked look. When she was finally able to speak, she admitted, It wasn't given to me by anyone. I stole it myself. Madison frowned tightly and her brows furrowed together. She didn't believe the woman for a second. But clearly, whoever was behind this had frightened Meg into silence. Coming out of the director's office, Madison and Allie walked arm in arm, giggling like they didn't have a care in the world. Ian had said he needed to make a call, so they walked around to find a place to wait. They went up to a nearby coffee cart, where Madison got a bottle of orange juice and Allie got a nice coffee. The two of them sat leisurely at a nearby table for a while before Allie thought of something. She turned to her friend and asked, Madison, did you show that advertisement to anyone besides me? Madison shook her head. But before she could speak, Jason suddenly sat down beside her, a cup of coffee in his hand, and a wide smile on his face. What are you doing here? Shouldn't you be on a plane to Moscow? Allie jokingly asked as she raised her eyebrows. She had previously had no idea that Jason could speak Russian at all, let alone fluently and she intended to tease him heavily about that fact. Jason smiled and took a sip of coffee. He looked back and forth between the two women, grinning, and then he asked, What, do you not want to spend time with me? You know, today's my last day of class. That's when I'll get to hang out with you again. Madison smiled at his antics. Jason was very popular, and he always knew how to be charming. Allie pursed her lips and retorted, if we wanted to have a girl talk, shoo, let us gossip in peace. She playfully waved her hand at him, as if he was a stray cat she was shooing away. 
Jason laughed and replied, Okay, how about this? I'll go back to my dorm and change out of this. He paused and gestured to his clothing, which was so casual, he might as well have been wearing pajamas. While you both wait for me here, I'll be back in a few minutes, and then we can go have lunch. Madison wanted to refuse, since they were still waiting for Ian to finish his call and come find them. Allie knew her friend well enough to tell that she didn't want to go, and was going to help her make an excuse, when Jason threw out some bait that he knew they wouldn't be able to resist. He leveled a serious look at them and said, I want to talk to you about Meg. That sentence was a stark reminder of the incident that had occurred less than an hour before. Both women grew serious and nodded, and then he went to go change. When he left, the women fell silent and contemplated their situation. After a long time, Allie asked, Do you have any idea who it could have been? Madison shook her head and sighed. Allie bit the straw in her coffee cup and asked, Okay, so other than me, you didn't show it to anyone. You sent it to me, but I deleted it right after I watched it. Who else could have gotten their hands on it? Madison had kept the only copy of the video on her laptop, which was either always with her or safely tucked away in her room. Unfortunately, she had been able to get nothing useful out of Meg, who still insisted she had stolen it herself, although she wouldn't explain how. I guess all I can do is press charges for intellectual property theft. Maybe at some point, she'll fess up to the truth, she thought. She was frustrated at not having answers, and she did take the sense of unease at the idea that some mystery person was sabotaging her. Seeing the concern on her friend's face, she smiled and tried to reassure her. And then she said, Let's not worry about it. It doesn't really matter who it was. I'll just be more careful from now on. Allie smiled back at her, and she felt her heart swell. She thought, Even if there is someone out to get me, at least I have such a loyal friend. The two women chatted happily while they waited for Jason and Ian to come back. When Ian walked around the building toward the coffee cart, he saw Madison tilting her head and laughing, highlighting the dimples on her face. Her beauty and the graceful way she held herself made his heart skip a beat. His appearance quickly attracted the attention of students nearby, who started whispering about the handsome men lingering around the cafe table. Madison felt someone watching her and looked over. When she saw Ian's eyes locked onto her, she blushed. Allie quirked her lips and smiled when she saw the two of them looking at each other. Taking advantage of the fact that Ian had yet to walk over, she teased, Looking at the two of you now, anyone watching would think you were in love. What are you talking about? Madison asked, pretending to be annoyed. Her face reddened even more as she continued, I have no idea what that's supposed to mean. Allie just grinned wider in response and watched the affectionate look on her friend's face as Ian approached. Her husband couldn't look away from her either. He walked to his wife's side and casually sat next to her. He glanced at the orange juice in Madison's hand and gestured to one of the employees of the cart, asking them to come over so he could order a coffee. After he sat down, it took less than a minute for the onlookers to start gossiping about them. Oh my god, is that Madison's husband? He's so handsome. He might be the best-looking man I've ever seen. How did Madison get so lucky? What I wouldn't do to be with someone that gorgeous. Madison's face was still flushed from looking at Ian, and she felt her ears turn red when she heard everyone talking around them. Allie sat quietly as she listened to the chit-chat. I don't know how she does it. First, she was with Luke for four years, and then she managed to snag a guy like that. Doesn't Jason follow her around too? I guess that she's pretty, but how does she keep all these guys wrapped around her little finger? Yeah, I don't get it. Luke, Jason, and now the doctor. I guess there's something about her that keeps men interested. The surrounding people didn't realize that the subjects of their gossip could hear them, so they kept chattering on without a care. Madison, however, was shifting uncomfortably in her seat. Do they have to say things like that where Ian can hear them? He's going to think I'm some kind of seductress, she thought. Allie noticed her friend's discomfort 
and quickly tried to distract her by talking to Ian. So I heard that you're a doctor at Mercy Hospital? What department are you in? Allie asked. Ian acted as if he didn't hear the discussions around him. The staff member brought over his coffee just then, so he thanked them before he turned back to Allie and replied, I haven't chosen a specialty yet, but I'm a surgical resident. Allie's eyes widened in response. She smiled and blushed a little as she asked, You're a surgeon? You know, I heard of this one surgeon who joined Mercy Hospital two years ago after he graduated from medical school in England. Rumor has it he is so skilled that people say he has magic hands. Do you know him? Madison was intrigued when she heard that. She knew that Allie was obsessed with doctors and kept up with the gossip about the hospitals nearby, so she would know if an especially skilled surgeon showed up. Not everyone was cut out for surgery. Even an average surgeon had to have incredibly steady hands since people's lives depended on the slightest movement of a scalpel. Some had to stay alert for over 12 hours to complete certain procedures. If someone had stood out so much compared to other surgeons, they must have been incredibly skilled. Madison turned to Ian in anticipation and eagerly asked, Who is it? Did I see them at the hospital? Ian took a sip of his coffee and peered back into his wife's dark eyes which were filled with curiosity. How do you know it's not me? He raised an eyebrow and asked. While he sounded as though he could have been joking, Madison felt a little chill at his words. Is he serious? Is he the one people are talking about? She wondered. She subconsciously glanced at Ian's hands, which was wrapped around his coffee cup. Is that one of the rumored magic hands? She mused. Everyone knew how valuable a surgeon's hands were, and that was especially true for someone skilled enough to spark gossip. It was rumored that some surgeons insured their hands for millions of dollars. Ian had such a pair of hands, but he thought nothing of putting his hand in hers. How could he trust me with something so precious? She wondered. Isn't he worried I'll hurt him? Ian could tell what Madison was thinking by the way she was staring at his hands. He gazed at her affectionately and smiled before he reached out to tuck a strand of hair behind her ear and suggested, Let's go get lunch. I have another surgery tomorrow morning, so I'll take you home afterwards so I can get some rest. As soon as he finished speaking, he stood up, but his face dropped when he saw a figure hurrying toward them. Luckily, only Madison was looking at his face, so Allie didn't notice the change. Hey, don't leave without me, Jason called out as he jogged over. He wore a simple t-shirt and jeans, which was a vast improvement over his previous outfit. When he saw the other man, his face darkened to match Ian's expression. Ah, Dr. Weston, he said, placing a sarcastic emphasis on the word doctor. You're here too. Great. Ian's expression didn't change. He just stood silently and looked at his wife, ignoring Jason completely. Madison felt a pit in her stomach. She remembered talking about Luke with Ian when he had said that if she didn't keep her ex-boyfriend at arm's length, he would have her stay with his family. Not wanting a repeat like that incident, she quickly stood up, and without waiting for Ian to reach out, she took the initiative to slide her small hand into his. Of course he came to pick me up. That's why he was in the office earlier, remember? We can all go to get lunch together, she suggested, hoping to relieve the tension between the two men. While she was nervous about them sitting at the same table, she wanted to hear what Jason had to say about Meg. On top of that, it would be a good opportunity for him to see that she was happily married, which would hopefully discourage his crush on her. With so much to gain about fearing the situation could turn awkward, Madison had to tread carefully. She looked to Allie for help every few moments. Eventually, Allie got the hint and interjected, Let's all go together. We're all friends after all, and we'll see a lot of each other in the future. Jason didn't say anything. He looked at Ian with clear disapproval as he thought about everything that had been said in Professor Becker's office. Ian, however, seemed completely at ease, smiling as he told everyone, You've both stood up for Madison at school, of course, 
I'd like to treat you to a meal. With that, he left them to wait while he went to get his car. While he was gone, Jason walked over to Madison so he could ask a question that had been nagging him for hours. He lowered his voice slightly and asked, What's going on with you and Luke? When Madison heard him, it took her a moment to figure out what he was asking. A little uncomfortably, she turned to look at Allie. She was embarrassed that she hadn't told her friend about the situation yet and wasn't sure what she would think. It wasn't a big deal. I broke up with him, and then he got engaged to my sister, Madison explained emotionlessly, as if she was telling a story that had nothing to do with her. He and I are in the past now. Allie raised her eyebrows in surprise as she thought, If I wasn't hearing this firsthand, I never would have thought things had ended between them so quickly. She relied on Luke so much. A tight smile came across Madison's face, as her friends took in what she had said. By that point, the entire school was likely chattering about her breakup with Luke. They had been a popular topic of gossip since they had first started going out together. The other students had admired her beauty and how loyal Luke had seemed. Everyone had assumed that they would get married as soon as they graduated. But instead, they had broken up, and Luke had immediately gotten engaged to someone else, with a wedding date set not far in the future. Her reputation had been so terrible for so long that even though Luke and Kelsey's engagement had caused a huge stir, few people thought to wonder about Madison's side of the story. Now that her name had been cleared, however, people were starting to get curious. The sound of a car honking made the three of them jump, and they all turned to see Ian driving up in his SUV. Madison took Allie's arm in hers and walked toward the car as if nothing had happened. Jason followed in silence, looking unhappy that their conversation had been cut short. Madison sat in the passenger seat, while Allie and Jason sat in the back. The three of them discussed where to eat, but they struggled to select a place that all of them were happy with, since they didn't want to go to the same restaurant they always did. Eventually, Ian suggested the Griffin, to which everyone immediately agreed. Besides Ian, they were all students so they didn't have much money to spend. Normally, they could never afford to eat somewhere as luxurious as the Griffin. Allie, who considered herself a foodie, was especially happy. She was chatting about all the amazing things she had heard about the place and how the chef was so renowned. After a few minutes, Ian interrupted their happy chatter to ask, Hey, everyone, do you want to invite Zach as well? Everyone agreed, so Ian asked Madison to call her brother. She was happy he was inviting the one family member who actually cared about her, but she was also a little suspicious. Ian was driving with earphones that allowed him to make calls, and a moment later, he did so to make a reservation at the restaurant. As she dialed her brother, she thought, Is there a reason he didn't want to call Zach himself? Maybe it's not a big deal, and he just thinks the invitation would be better if it came from me. When the car pulled in front of the Griffin, the valet quickly ran out to meet them and graciously welcomed them to the restaurant. The group of four then headed inside. This time, the manager, Mr. Williams, was present when they entered, and when he saw Ian, he rushed over immediately to greet him. It's good to see you, Dr. Weston. Which room would you like to use today? I'll ensure it's set up right away. Allie and Jason stood awkwardly to the side feeling out of place in such a luxurious restaurant, especially when they saw how the manager acted toward Ian. They looked at each other in surprise, wondering why Ian rated such treatment. The staff was accustomed to wealthy or well-known guests, and it was out of the ordinary for a regular customer to get such attention. Ian casually put one hand in his pocket and held Madison's hand with the other. The usual room will do, thank you, he answered. While Madison knew Ian's real social status, she was still constantly surprised by the influence of the Weston family. She did feel annoyed that her husband insisted on hiding his true identity while making no effort to act accordingly. Doesn't he realize that people are going to figure out who he is if he keeps accepting treatment like this? She thought. Mr. Williams instructed a server to check that it was ready before he personally led the group to the private room which was called the Platinum Room. 
according to the plaque on the door. They all settled into the comfortable space, which was outfitted with couches and lounge chairs, as well as the dining table. Soon after, Zach was led to the room as well. When he appeared at the door, Madison looked up and smiled brightly. Hey, Zach. She sweetly greeted her brother. She walked over and took his hand before leaving him to sit on the other side of Ian at the dining table. Then she gestured to her friends and said, Let me introduce you to my classmates. This is Allie and this is Jason. As Madison sat down, Zach nodded at the two others in greeting. When he looked at Allie, his calm and confident attitude made her blush, and she smiled shyly at him. Madison turned to her friends to chat, assuming that Ian had invited Zach so that the two of them could talk. The three students talked about interesting things that had happened at school while eating the snacks that had been served. The atmosphere was comfortable. Ian saw Madison's happy face and smiled as he poured a glass of red wine for Zach and himself. The two of them got up and walked over to the couch in the corner so they could talk privately. From now on, we're family, and I'll think of you as a brother. Please believe that I'll take good care of your sister. Ian raised his glass and stated. Zach quirked an eyebrow. After a minute, he responded, Ian, my sister has been through a lot, and she has a strong personality. She isn't just arm candy or someone you can use as a placeholder. Please remember that. Ian's expression didn't change. He held his glass out in front of him, not wanting to take a sip until the conversation was settled. Madison shot them a troubled glance from her seat at the table. While she couldn't hear what the men were saying, she really hoped that Zack and Ian could get along well. When she saw them pause in the middle of a toast, she started to get nervous. Her brother's opinion meant a lot to her, and it was important that he gave her marriage his blessing. Ian smiled at his brother-in-law as he reassured him. I think you misunderstand my intentions. I know Madison is her own person, and I respect that. I'm not just expecting her to mindlessly fill a role. Zach didn't seem reassured. He glanced at the dining table as he leaned forward, setting his wine glass down on a nearby coffee table. Worried about being overheard, he whispered, Ian, I'm not an idiot. I consider it my job to look out for Madison, and I want to be very clear about this. I expect you to treat my sister with respect. If you don't, well... I know all about Claire Thompson. If I hear that Madison's being mistreated, I'll assume she's the reason why. With that, he smiled, picked up his glass again, and took a sip. When Madison glanced back at the couch, she saw her brother relaxing and drinking wine, which caused her to let out a sigh of relief. She turned back to her friends with a smile and joined their conversation. With his line of sight over his wine glass, Zack looked at his sister with loving eyes. I've always been there to look out for her. There's no way I'm going to stop now. She might have made the decision to get married without me knowing, but I still need to make sure she'll be all right, he thought. Ian narrowed his eyes and pursed his lips at the mention of his ex-girlfriend. He stared at the other man for some time without saying anything. After what felt like a century had passed, he softly replied, I won't let her down. Zack smirked, clearly doubtful, as he took another sip of wine. He cast a sidelong glance at his sister's husband and asked, Why should I believe you? You know very well that the matter between the Thompsons and Westons won't be resolved so easily. After all, you were together for two years. Do you really expect me to believe your feelings for her have just disappeared? Zack knew very well that Ian had been in a serious relationship with the daughter of a very prominent family. If you compared our families, the Thompsons are even more important than the Greenwalds. I don't want my sister caught in the crossfire of such powerful families, he thought. Look, I don't care what kind of messy romantic baggage you have. I only want you to... Zack trailed off, his expression growing more serious. His voice was a mix of frustration and concern as he said... I want you to remember who your wife is. As soon as he finished speaking, the two men's eyes met, but it wasn't a moment of connection. It was as though they were staring each other down. 
back was determined to protect his sister, and Ian was starting to get offended at the assumptions his brother-in-law was making. On the couch in the corner of the room, Ian and Zack were locked in a serious conversation. After a moment of tense silence, Ian reached out and poured more wine into Zack's glass. Then he said in a low voice, I'll always remember very clearly that my wife is Madison. Zack wasn't sure if that was a joke or a promise. I suppose that all depends on how you choose to act from now on, Zack thought. If Ian was willing to support her, Madison would become a prominent member of the Weston family. If he wasn't, she could end up stuck in a miserable relationship with no way out. After that, the two of them didn't talk about the matter anymore. The conversation moved to gossip about mutual dealings and acquaintances, and although Madison still couldn't hear what they were saying, she felt the atmosphere improving between the two of them. Unfortunately, their pleasant lunch was about to take an unexpected turn. Without knowing that her actions would invite unwanted trouble, Madison turned to her friends and suggested ordering some food. The orange duck they serve here is just amazing. I think it's called... She trailed off as she scanned the menu for the name of the dish. Right, the duck is the orange. Ellie, I'm sure you'll love it. When her friends nodded in agreement, Madison pressed the service button to let the wait staff know they wanted assistance. Only a moment later, when a server came in, she said, Have an order of the duck a la orange, please. Allie, Jason, what else would you... Before she could finish speaking, a voice from out in the hall interrupted her, saying, Do we hear Madison Greenwald's voice? A second later, Emmett Morris, Luke's father, came through the door which the server had left open behind him. While Madison had never met him in person, she recognized him right away. It is Madison, Emmett said. He then turned to speak to someone behind him. I heard that she's going to get married as well, Luke. I heard that the two of you go to the same college. Did you met each other? Madison felt her stomach drop in dread as the door opened wider, and Luke walked in. What the hell are they doing here? She wondered. Unable to stop her face from twisting, she looked as though she had bitten into something sour. For some reason, although she was good at navigating social situations and choosing her words wisely, she had never quite grasped the ability to keep her emotions off her face. She had always worn her heart on her sleeve, unlike her younger sister, who had always been better at hiding her real feelings. That was part of the reason Kelsey was considered the friendlier of the two women. Luke walked in, and his eyes fell on Madison. She wore a simple yet classy dress, since she wanted to be dressed appropriately for her college presentation. Yes, we've met. She's Kelsey's older sister, he softly replied to his father. Suddenly, another voice rang out. What are you doing here? Stella asked, her tone full of dissatisfaction. Her husband was standing just behind her with an unhappy look on his face as usual. Madison, stop following your brother around like a lost puppy. How old are you? She shook her head in annoyance. Don't ask your brother to seek help from the family if this blows up in your face. Even if we end up having a decent relationship with the Weston family, we don't want you to come crawling back for money, she mocked. Emmett raised his brows at Stella's words. He turned his head to look at Kelsey, who had walked in behind Luke and felt satisfied as he chuckled and said, I never knew that the Greenwald family was connected to the Westons. Don't worry though, Kelsey. You'll have a good marriage. If Luke gives you a hard time in the future, just tell me, and I'll help you deal with him. You won't have to ask your parents for anything. His little speech clearly outlined where Kelsey would stand in the Morris family. Madison, however, was particularly annoyed by Stella's behavior. She rolled her eyes and thought, she still has no idea who Ian's family is. If they heard her speaking that way, they'd be furious. Not that she'd dare to open her big mouth if she knew how influential the Westons really were. Mom, why are you all here? Zack asked as he got up and walked over. His face gave no clues as to what he was feeling or thinking. 
The family had recently tried to use him to hurt his sister, so he didn't want to give them any more ammunition. He would need to tread carefully at the moment. Ian invited us out for lunch, Zach informed. With that, Stella seemed to notice Ian for the first time. Her lips pursed in disdain as she spoke. I'm not sure how you even managed to get a room in the Griffin. I hope you're planning to pay for your bill and don't expect us to cover it for you later. Madison flushed with anger and moved to stand up. But Allie grabbed her arm and stopped her. Jason sat in silence, looking as though he couldn't believe the scene that was unfolding in front of him. Ian, Madison, you came here for lunch? Kelsey asked. Her voice was gentle and light, making Luke's tight expression loosen. Why don't you come with us so we can talk about wedding plans? Maybe you can use it as an opportunity to get some classy ideas for your celebration. While her sister's offer sounded genuine on the surface, Madison knew she was trying to dig at her and Ian. Allie's face twisted into something ugly as she looked at Kelsey. This time, Madison had to grab her arm to stop her friend from getting up and yelling at the uninvited group. There were five people there who attended the same college, so they were all aware that Madison and Luke had been dating for four years. Allie and Jason were stunned that Kelsey dared to not only steal her sister's boyfriend, but to flaunt her relationship this way in public. Even though Kelsey was younger than her sister, she had always wanted to be the first one to get married. She was willing to do almost anything to make sure that happened. To make matters worse, it was now clear to everyone that Luke had never told his family about his relationship with Madison. Ian got up off the couch and came around to stand next to his wife. He faced the newcomers and softly replied, Thank you, but there's no need. My family has already started making preparations for our wedding celebration. Kelsey stiffened slightly, but she ensured her face still looked pleasant as she thought, come every time I try to say anything to my sister, he always seems to be there. He's ruining everything. I don't even know why he likes her, let alone why he's always interfering in our business. Kelsey was about to say something when the manager came through the door with the waiter who was carrying their food. Annoyed at the interruption, her gaze landed on a plate of duck. Surprised at the sight, she asked, Didn't the hostess say that the kitchen was out of duck? I tried to order some when we arrived 20 minutes ago. Where did this come from? As she finished speaking, the Morrises and Greenwalds all turned to look at the manager. Mr. Williams gestured that the server should deliver the food before turning back to his disgruntled guest. An apologetic look was on his face as he said, My apologies, Miss Greenwald. We were very low on our supply of duck when you tried to order. Since we knew the Weston family had a reservation, and they ordered the dish on their last visit, we held a serving for them as a courtesy. Everyone went silent. However, Mr. Williams seemed to not realize the impact of his words and continued, Although the Griffin hosts guests of all levels of wealth and fame, we have to ensure we stay in the Weston family's good graces, of course. While we can't serve you, Duck, I'd be happy to personally bring you anything else on the menu. Luke, Kelsey, and their families felt a chill at the manager's words. This was the most exclusive highbrow restaurant in the city. Not only did some of the most powerful people in the country visit regularly, but it's also rumored that the Phantom owned this restaurant. They had all no idea why the manager of such an establishment would be so afraid of offending a simple boxer. Mr. Williams, you must be joking. John said as he took a step forward and smiled. Though I appreciate you trying to be gracious to Dr. Weston. Mr. Williams' eyes darted back and forth between the two groups, and he was clearly flustered by the situation. He looked at Ian, who used his head to gesture toward the hallway, indicating that the manager should step out. He gratefully took the opportunity to leave. Stella stepped further into the room, with John and Emmett following behind her. She and Zoe Morris, Luke's mother, were talking and laughing as they nonchalantly took a seat at the table. They looked around and noticed that there wasn't much food left beside the recently delivered duck, and Stella quickly pressed the service button to call the waitstaff. As soon as the server returned to the room, she rudely demanded, The problem here? There's not enough food for our group. 
Hurry up and bring some more dishes. She scoffed and added, How could they serve this to us? All of this would be a sad excuse for leftovers, let alone an actual meal. Are they trying to insult us? Madison had been trying very hard not to react to her family, but she couldn't bear it any longer. She walked around the table to face Stella and blurted, Mom, didn't you all have something to talk about? Go to your private room. We aren't done here yet. Stella's face immediately darkened. She slammed her palm on the table, stood up, and then pointed at Madison as she asserted, You shameless brat. Do you think you could have gotten in here if it weren't with your brother? Do you have any idea what kind of place this is? I can't imagine what possessed you to bring your little friends here. You even asked Griffin to give you the platinum room. Are you brainless? This room is incredibly exclusive. Who do you think you are, do you? Unable to take any more, Zack interrupted. I've never been allowed to book this room. His words caused them all to fall silent again. Then, in a less polite tone, he added, It's always been reserved for the Weston family. As far as I know, it's never been used to entertain regular guests. No one spoke. The Greenwalds and the Morrises were all frozen in place, while Allie and Jason looked around the room as though they were looking for someone. After a moment, Madison thought, They're trying to figure out where the Whiteson family is and why we were allowed to use their private room. Her expression didn't give anything away, and Ian stood quietly beside her. The Weston family? Kelsey repeated, looking straight at her brother. Her smile was tight as she said, Zack, I think you might be mistaken. If this is their exclusive room, then where are they? I understand if you're upset with us, considering everything that's going on. You don't have to be like this. Emmett's puzzled eyes scanned everyone in the room and finally fell upon Ian. He furrowed his brows and spoke, Is anyone from the Weston family here? Madison's father had a particularly unpleasant look on his face. While he may have suspected Ian before, he had dismissed the idea entirely. No matter what his last name was, he was a simple doctor, and John was sure that Ian would have made his family connections known if he had any. John stomped over to the dining table and said, There is someone named Weston here, but he's just a surgeon. Don't be ridiculous. Let's sit down and eat so we can discuss our daughter's wedding plans. Emmett looked suspiciously at Ian, who was still standing in silence. However, he expected that since the man was John's son-in-law, they would all know if he was connected to a powerful family. He followed everyone else's lead and assumed that his last name was simply a coincidence. Shrugging, he went to sit beside his wife and waved for Luke to follow suit, while Kelsey sat by her mother. They paid no mind to the original guest of the room. Madison frowned and opened her mouth to speak, but her stepmother interjected before she could say anything. You all should go. This place isn't a place where you can just do as you please. Stella exclaimed, gesturing to Madison, Ian, Jason, and Allie. She then arrogantly turned to look at her oldest son. Zack, go out and eat some more. This duck looks delicious. You should try some. The fury in Madison's heart kept rising. Ever since they had appeared, they had treated her like they owned the place, and she was intruding on their private gathering. Ridiculous. They're ridiculous. This is possibly the most entitled thing I've ever seen them do. I'm saying something, she thought. She tightly pursed her lips and took a deep breath as she gathered her emotions. While her father had always been rude, they were taking their behavior to a new level and were now embarrassing her in front of her friends. Their actions were so unbelievable that she almost laughed. Zack and Ian watched her and waited to see what she would do. Jason hesitantly stood up and took a few steps away from the table. Allie came forward to take her friend's hand as she worriedly said, Madison is fine. We got to eat most of our lunch at least. Why don't we just head somewhere else? As her best friend, 
She was well aware of how hard it was for Madison to keep her thoughts to herself, and how bluntly she spoke her mind. To avoid making a scene, she tried to encourage her friend to leave. There's a garden nearby that's supposed to be really nice, she added. Why don't we check that out? Madison turned to Allie and Jason, both of whom had looks of pity on their faces. At that moment, she felt tired of having such an inconsiderate family. She thought, maybe we should just leave. I don't know if I have the energy to deal with them right now. Just as she made that decision, her stepmother chose to open her mouth again. Madison, on your way out, Mr. Williams, to make some more duck for us. There isn't enough here for everyone. I heard that Luke's sister Lynn likes ducks, too. We have to get more for her, Stella instructed, as though ordering her stepdaughter around was the most natural thing in the world. She didn't even bother to look up as she spoke. Really, look at the food on the table. This is just insulting. Madison, who had already turned to walk to the door, suddenly let out a sharp breath. Her face twisted into a sneer as she stretched out her hand and forcefully opened the door all the way, slamming it into the wall and startling everyone in the room. Excuse me, she called out to the wait staff in the hall, her voice shaking in anger. These people were not invited to join us. Please escort them out. I hope that the next time we come here, you won't let anyone just wander into our room. The staff member who was closest to the room was stunned for a moment, but he quickly came back to his senses and spoke into the microphone that was attached to his collar. A moment later, he walked in and went straight over to the people who were still sitting at the dining table. He cleared his throat and said, mm, Excuse me, everyone. May I escort you to wherever you are supposed to be? This room was not reserved for you today. His words incited rage among the newcomers at the table. Some of their mouths dropped open in offense, and they sputtered to come up with a response. Stella was the first to recover her senses, slamming her silverware onto the table, and standing up as she furiously said, Madison, you're such an embarrassment. What is wrong with you? Why would you cause trouble for your sister on such a special occasion? Where did you learn to be so disrespectful? Get out of here and stop making a fool of yourself. In the past, if Madison had gotten his treatment from Stella, she might have kept quiet. But since she knew that Ian would protect her, and Zach was there as well, she felt much more confident. She looked at Stella with a blank face and calmly stated, If you're so concerned with being embarrassed, I suggest you leave now. Otherwise, if security has to escort you out, you'll experience an entirely new level of embarrassment. Allie stood by Madison's side and was unsure what to do as she looked back and forth between her friend and the people at the table. You evil girl, John yelled. This was the first time he had been embarrassed in front of the Morrises, and he wasn't going to stand for it. His eyes were wide open in anger as he shouted, Get out! Your brother is the only reason you're even here, no matter what he tries to say. I can't believe my daughter would dare to disobey us this way. Your brother has spoiled you way too much. Zack had been watching silently, but he was anxious to come to his sister's defense. He couldn't bear to let her be treated so horribly. As he took a step forward, Ian reached out and stopped him. He sighed and nodded at the other man, indicating that he would let his sister handle the situation. As he observed the scene, he felt a pain in his heart and thought, How many times have they spoken to her like this while I was away? This was even worse than I thought. Madison looked at her parents, but instead of yelling or getting angry, she just smiled and waited quietly as she turned to look at her sister. Clearly, she was waiting for Kelsey to speak. Here we go. Kelsey would never pass up an opportunity like this. Any moment now, she'll say something to slander me in front of everyone here, she thought. In fact, that was a large part of the reason that Madison's reputation had declined so much over the years. Right on cue, Kelsey reached out to hold Luke's arm with a pitiful expression on her face. 
He looked at Madison and softly said, Madison, please don't be angry with our parents. I know it's my fault. I shouldn't have tried to get married before you. You have thrown an engagement party so soon. I understand why you're unhappy with me, but please, would you not take it out on Mom and Dad? Allie stared at Kelsey, dumbfounded at the woman's dramatic performance. There had been many rumors around the school about Madison's sister, discussing how delicate and soft-spoken she was. If I wasn't seeing this with my own eyes, I wouldn't believe it. She's so manipulative and shameless. How could she do this to her sister? She wondered. Just then, Mr. Williams arrived at the door of the private room with some of his staff. They all overheard what Kelsey said. With Madison's luck, there would be a new rumor about her by the next day. Luke was sure that Kelsey was right, and Madison was acting out due to jealousy. His eyes scanned her, and he made no effort to conceal his thoughts. Ian saw the man's look, and his face grew angry. Stella and Luke were close to each other, so even though her future son-in-law was in her peripheral vision, she still caught the lecherous look on his face. Shocked, she turned to stare at him. This time, she grew so angry that she walked around the table and shouted in Madison's face, You shameless girl! Get out of here immediately! You've been using your wiles to seduce countless men, and now you've turned your sights on your future brother-in-law. I really don't know how a family like ours produced a horrible child like you. She raised her hand high as she continued, Today, you'll finally learn your place. Allie was a few feet away and didn't have time to react when she noticed Stella was about to slap her friend. Her face went pale and she stood there helplessly. Madison was shocked by her stepmother yelling a foot away from her face and didn't recover in time to defend herself. By the time she noticed Stella's hand, there was no time to react. Unfortunately, Stella had recently gotten a particular type of manicure, and her long fingernails had been filed to a sharp point. If she slapped Madison, her nails would undoubtedly scratch the young woman's face, and they might even leave a scar. Even though Ian's interactions with the Greenwalds had been limited, he had still been able to predict what was about to happen. As soon as Stella had come over, he had been on guard. So when she moved to slap Madison, her hand didn't land on her stepdaughter's face. Instead, it landed on the back of Ian's hand. He hadn't had enough time to grab her arm, so he could only stick his hand out to protect his wife. It took Madison a moment to realize what had happened, and her dark eyes widened in concern. Allie's mouth dropped open, and Zach's frown deepened. Jason peered around them, his face completely blank with shock. Madison frantically reached out to grab her husband's hand and inspected it, only to find that her stepmother had actually injured him. The back of his hand was scratched deeply and bleeding, and Stella was yelling, though she sounded more like a shrieking banshee. Ian, are you insane? Why did you do that? She shouted, her face pale as she reached out to grab her nails with her other hand. She quickly inspected them to see if any of them had been broken. Her eyes narrowed, and she looked at Ian fiercely, as if he had been the one to hit her, and not the other way around. You sad little doctor. Why are you pretending to be some kind of hero? Do you think you can protect Madison from every little thing? Let me tell you this. She's still the daughter of the Greenwald family, so I'll treat her how I like. If you think... Shut the hell up! Madison suddenly shouted, shocking Stella into silence. Stella stared at her stepdaughter, her eyes and mouth both wide open in surprise. Madison was furious, and an angry growl rose from her throat. Although she was far from a medical expert, she knew the importance of a surgeon's hands, and Ian was much more than an average surgeon. His hands had been widely praised due to how steady and skilled they were. The gossip about them was on par with the rumors about the mysterious phantom who played the stock market. 
She turned her back to Stella and stood between her and Ian, as though she was shielding him from further harm. Allie's eyes were wide in astonishment, and she thought, I've never seen that side of her before. I'm warning you, Madison said to her stepmother without bothering to turn around. If Ian Panda is permanently injured, you'll regret this for the rest of your life. You'd better pray that he's all right. Otherwise, there's no way you'll be able to afford to compensate him. Even if you sold all the family's possessions, she yelled. Everyone present looked at Madison like she was a stranger. The kind of hostility she was showing was as frightening as it was surprising. Kelsey looked at her sister, her face completely white. Even Luke was shocked. In the four years they had been together, he had never seen Madison act this way. Ian narrowed his eyes and pursed his lips in pain, but he didn't seem put off by his wife's behavior. I don't find that she has a bit of a temper. Life with her definitely won't be boring, he thought. After looking over Ian's wound, Madison turned around, her face wild with anger as she exclaimed, I'm sure you're too stupid to grasp how important a surgeon's hands are, since they're only concerned with your nails. Shockingly, you've made it so far in life with so little self-awareness. When John heard his wife get insulted, he immediately came to her defense. He strode over, but before he could say anything, Madison turned and stared straight into his eyes. Enunciating each word for effect, she addressed the manager. Mr. Williams, we looked at this private room for ourselves, not for these intrusive people. Now, not only do I need you to escort all of them out, but I also want you to clean this room. I don't want to see any trace that they were ever here. John was so enraged that the veins on his forehead were bulging. As soon as Madison finished, Mr. Williams politely responded, Please, rest assured that I'll settle this matter. I guarantee that when you visit the Griffin in the future, this kind of thing will never happen again. This was the result of our employee's negligence. Please accept my sincerest apologies for this experience. Madison didn't say anything as she watched security staff enter the room one by one. The Greenwalds and Morrises, however, were deeply offended and fuming at their treatment. In all the time I've lived in this city, I've never been so insulted. It would have been bad enough if that brat hadn't embarrassed me in front of Emmett. Will he think of our family now? John thought. Well, he was enraged at his daughter's behavior and Griffin's staff. Emmett's fury was directed at John. He was disgusted with the man's actions and thought, Does he expect me to agree to join our families together when he can't even control his daughter? He snorted heavily, turned to his son and instructed, Call your sister and tell her not to come. We're clearly not welcome here. John knew that this incident with the Morris family, which was not good since there was still something he needed from them, Standing with his wife and son, Emmett looked over at John with a disappointed expression as he said, John, I didn't realize that the Greenwald family never taught their children how to behave properly. You can't even manage your daughter. How do you manage Silverwood? What a joke. John felt his anger rising, but at that moment, he couldn't say or do anything without making matters worse. There were too many people present, and even the security guards of the Griffin were standing behind him, waiting to walk them out of the room. At that moment, the staff started to lose patience, and one of the guards nudged Stella toward the door. She puffed up in anger and shouted, Dare you! I'm Zack Greenwald's mother! He's good friends with the oldest Weston son, you know! Aren't you afraid that the Westons will find out about this? We fired in an instant! When he heard that, Emmett, who had started to walk toward the door, stopped in his tracks. He looked at Stella in disbelief and thought, Zack is friends with one of the Westons? It's where their influence comes from. They made me think they were a powerful family all on their own. He decided to try a different strategy. So with a smile, he reached out and patted Madison's shoulder, softly saying, Why don't we take a moment to think about this? Don't be so angry with your parents. This whole thing is getting blown out of proportion. 
If you don't like us being here, we can just change rooms. After saying that, he turned to look at Zack and added, Now that I think about it, there may not be any more private rooms left at this point. Could you call your friend Daniel Weston, right? Why don't you ask him if he could get us into the room next door? Madison rolled her eyes in annoyance. From what she had heard of Emmett's dealings in the business world, he was as cunning as a fox. He looked harmless, but he was skilled at subtly manipulating people to get what he wanted. He's not just trying to get a private room. He's trying to test Zack's friendship with the Westons. He wants to know if he can use that relationship to his advantage, she realized. Naturally, Zack knew what the man was trying to do. At that moment, instead of expressing obvious dissatisfaction, he calmly rejected Emmett's request. It seems that you've misunderstood. The reservation of this private room really has nothing to do with me, or my friendship with Daniel for that matter. It was because of other members of the Weston family. You should know that the Platinum Room is mostly used by one of Daniel's younger brothers. As for a different room, even if I was willing to call my friend, there's no guarantee that he could get the room for you. I have no idea what may be going on over there. Madison didn't have the time or energy to keep watching these people behave like clowns. Seeing that they only cared about their interests and not about Ian's injury, she felt her temper rising again. Mr. Williams, she demanded, I want to see this place cleared out and cleaned up in ten minutes. After that, she ignored everyone else, choosing to grab Ian's uninjured hand and walk out in a hurry. She paid no mind to the sound of her stepmother screaming like a toddler behind her. Before Ian could react, Madison had already pulled him out of the room. He could still clearly hear his mother-in-law screaming behind him. You're going to eat crow for this. Do you have any idea who you're dealing with? I'm Stella Greenwald. Daniel Weston once said I was a family. How dare you treat me this way? Be lucky to ever work again. Let go of me. I'll leave on my own. In fact, I'm never coming back to this place. John's voice joined in a moment later. Zach, why are you being like this? Kelsey shouted. Why is Madison treating us like intruders? We're still family, aren't we? John, you're really something else. Emmett's voice rang out. I thought you had something to offer my family, but we've all been humiliated because of your daughter. You should be ashamed of yourself. I won't forget how you've embarrassed my family today. Zoe cried out next, saying, So, this is what the Greenwald family is really like. Ian listened to the shouting and bickering with amusement, while his wife fretted over his hand. What if your hand is seriously injured? I don't want this to keep you from working. She said, eyeing his scratches in concern. He looked at her with affection written all over his face. Madison didn't realize it, but Ian would always remember that moment when, despite everything that was going on, her biggest concern was his well-being. But Madison had no idea what her husband was thinking, and it was the least of her concerns. The only thing she was worried about was getting him to a doctor, so his hands could be checked by a professional. We have to go to the hospital as soon as possible, she whispered, urging him out of the restaurant. She was fidgeting nervously as they walked down the sidewalk, putting her hands in her pockets for a moment before running one of them through her hair and then crossing her arms in front of her. Her eyes were also wandering, causing her to bump into another young woman, their heads banging together painfully. Her hand shot up to cover her forehead and she moaned, Oh, that hurt. Ian's attention snapped to her, his injured hand coming up to rest on her shoulder. He moved his hand freely since his injury wasn't as serious as his wife believed. I should have put my foot down and insisted I was fine. Besides, even if my hands are important for my work, they're not what makes me valuable, he thought. The other woman was also holding her head and started to yell at Madison. Can you watch where you're going? Is this the first time you've been on a public sidewalk? She said loudly. The woman was wincing in pain, 
and her eyes were filled with tears. Despite that, she continued to shout, Do you just walk around with your eyes closed? What's wrong with you? While the woman was yelling, Ian pulled his wife closer to him, as though he was shielding her from harm. Although she was still disoriented from hitting her head and getting yelled at by a stranger, she instinctively moved into his arms. A few moments later, she came back to her senses and blushed as she looked at her husband. The other woman seemed to have orientated herself, and when she caught sight of Ian, she suddenly stopped. She smiled and reached out a hand to touch his arm as she said, Ian, what a surprise. Did you hear that I was back and come over here to see me? Madison stiffened in response to the woman's words and turned to look at her. When she did, she recognized her immediately. She was Luke's little sister, Lynn, who had been away in London studying ballet. Lynn had her hair in a neat ponytail and her forehead was a little red, but she still looked dignified and a beautiful smile lit up her face. She wore an elegant black and white cocktail dress and a pair of brand name ballet flats. Something was charming about the way she held herself. Ian looked at Lynn and blinked in surprise, but quickly recovered. He wrapped one of his arms around Madison's waist. There was a smile on his face that didn't quite reach his eyes as he said, Hi, Lynn. I didn't know you were coming to visit. When did you get back? Lynn wasn't stupid. So when she saw Ian holding a woman so closely, she knew what it meant. So she was a bit surprised to see him with someone. Her gaze scanned Madison and she thought, She's actually fairly beautiful. Not that she can really compare with me or anyone else at the Academy. Although they were clearly a couple, she left her hand on Ian's arm. You know, you haven't been to London in a long time. I haven't seen you in forever. Don't tell me you don't like me anymore, Lynn asked with a flirtatious pout, acting as though Madison were invisible. Do you not want to pay attention to me just because Claire went to Germany? Of course not. Now that you're back, I'm sure I'll see you in the future. Ian replied. Madison didn't speak as she watched the scene unfold in front of her. She could feel Ian's warm palm on her waist, but somehow it felt colder than before. She was a sensitive person and was very intuitive when it came to emotions. Whether it was family, friends, or a romantic situation, she could sense changes and when things were wrong. Just from what she had seen in the past few minutes, she could tell Ian was hiding something from her. There's something he's not telling me about his past relationship. How does he know Lynn? And who is Claire? She wondered. Suddenly, she felt her chest tightening. Leaning into Ian's embrace, she placed her hand on his chest and tried to control her breathing, even as she felt her heart start to beat faster. So I'll be back for a month this time. Can I come and visit you? Lynn continued to speak. Her body language indicated that she was very comfortable with Ian, and that she had likely known him for a long time. I haven't seen you since Claire left the ballet academy. Ian kept smiling, and he didn't pull his arm out of Lynn's grip. His face was full of complicated emotions that Madison couldn't quite decipher. Why isn't he pulling away? Can he seriously not tell that she's interested in him? She wondered. Ian nodded in response. From where she was standing, she could see the wound on the back of his hand, which had stopped bleeding for the time being. It wasn't as serious as she had first thought. As she looked at it, she thought, He really only needs some disinfectant and a band-aid. With that, she had an idea. I think you and I... Lynn started speaking when Madison interrupted. Ian, I think we should go disinfect your hand and get a band-aid, she said raising her head to look at Ian and ignoring the other woman entirely. If Ian had looked down at her at that moment, he would have seen the anxiety in his wife's eyes. Unfortunately, he didn't look at her at all. Instead, he glanced down at his hand, smiled indifferently, and said, I think it's fine. It's such a small injury. I'm not worried about it. Madison's heart sank when she heard his response. That caused Lynn to see the wound on Ian's hand. She immediately glared at Madison and said, You should be more careful. How could you let anything happen to his hand? Don't you know how important his hands are? 
Ian raised his eyebrows in response and noticed how stiff his wife was. Her face was still pale, as if she hadn't recovered from the shock after the incident with her family. His face was also slightly pale. Only then did he remember that Luke was Lynn's brother. Madison had dated Luke for four years, so he would have expected the women to know each other. In fact, they had already met, but only once. It had been three years before when Lynn had come back to visit her family. She hadn't liked Madison because she tended to dislike beautiful women. But she didn't give any indication that she remembered her. Madison was quiet for a while as she waited for Ian to speak. But he didn't say anything. She couldn't keep herself from smirking at the situation as she thought, She don't know what Ian thinks about Lynn, but she's definitely in love with him. As Madison and Ian stood along with Lynn, Madison grew impatient and hurried to take Ian to a doctor. However, Ian insisted on not bothering about the injury. Let's not talk about the injury for now, Madison said after taking a deep breath. Pastoring the poor young lady won't help anything, she added, looking at Lynn. On the other hand, Lynn could read between the lines. Madison is clearly insinuating that I can't see the bigger picture. She thinks I'm being a nuisance, she thought angrily. Her face flushed as she glared at her. Ian, who had been distracted, snapped to attention. Seeing the annoyance in Lynn's eyes, he frowned. All right, Lynn, we have a lot to do. We can always talk later, but right now, we have to get going, he said carefully. He then walked off with Madison and left Lynn standing there. Madison lowered her head and frowned, but kept her mouth shut. It's going on she wondered. She had originally assumed that Ian and Lynn had some history, but after bearing witness to Ian's actions, it seemed that wasn't the case at all. Suddenly, a word flashed across her mind. The name that Lynn had said, Claire. Before getting in the car, Madison turned her head and glanced at Ian suspiciously. She realized that she knew nothing about his past. She paused to consider what she did know, he was the elusive third child of the Weston family. He was a famous surgeon at Mercy Hospital, known for his steady and reliable hands. She knew that he was her husband, and the two of them would soon celebrate their wedding. However, she knew next to nothing about his past and his inner world. She didn't know what made him tick, what he liked or didn't like, or the things that kept him up at night. Madison sat pensively in the car, she zoned out for a bit, lost in her thoughts, trying to remember something she couldn't quite put her finger on. That's it. When he asked him if he wanted to marry me, the answer, the true answer, was clearly right in front of me. I just didn't dare to hear it. But now I want to know his answer. I want to know how he really feels. Was I too afraid to ask before because I'm too afraid of rejection? She mumbled in her head. Ian didn't seem to notice Madison's pensive silence. He drove her home and then back to the Weston house, leaving Madison standing alone by her front door, watching his car back out of the driveway. He really has no idea, she thought sadly. That night, Madison sat in the bathtub. The air was filled with the sweet fragrance of her shower gel. Bubbles foamed up around her. Her arms hung over the sides of the tub, and her head poked out of the water. Other than that, Madison's body was completely hidden beneath the bubbles. She sat in the tub until her fingers turned croony. She was lost in thought. Who is this Claire person Lynn talked about? Ian's ex-girlfriend, she muttered. Ian, at 27, was almost four years older than her. Madison would be surprised if he had never had a girlfriend before. But is Claire one of his exes? And what did Ian mean when he was speaking to Lynn earlier? She wondered. Madison's thin eyebrows were tightly knitted together, and her normally clear eyes grew misty with emotion. It was only when her phone rang that she finally climbed out of the bathtub. It was Jason. Earlier at the restaurant, she had left Jason and Allie behind in a huff and had forgotten all about them. Allie was used to her moods, but Jason might be sensitive to them. 
Because of this, Madison tried to control her tone when she picked up the phone. Hello? It was a little noisy on Jason's end. In the background, she could hear people drunkenly singing pop songs. He must be at a karaoke bar, she thought. Luckily, they could still hear each other. Why aren't you here yet? Jason asked nervously. The whole class is here. You're the only one missing. Are you stuck in traffic or something? Madison realized what he was talking about with a sinking stomach. About a month ago, her class had decided to go out for a karaoke night to celebrate the end of their final semester at college. It was to be their last big night out. Madison had been planning to go, but she had completely forgotten it was happening. She palmed her face in annoyance and inwardly cursed herself. You can't believe I forgot. Yeah, I am stuck on the road. I'll be there soon, she said. On the other end of the call, Jason heaved a sigh of relief. He had been afraid that Madison wouldn't show up. After all, the earlier incident with the Griffin had been no small matter. Both the Greenwald and the Morris families had been really pissed off. He had worried that Madison's family would forbid her to go out because of it. Wonderful, Jason said. And no worries, we'll wait for you. Rather than entering the private karaoke room, he waited outside the bar entrance. Leaning against a tree, he quietly watched the road, waiting for Madison to turn the corner. His heart fluttered every time a car drove by. He had so much he wanted to tell her. After Madison hung up the phone, she quickly changed clothes. She was in such a hurry that she neglected to check her bag to make sure she had everything she needed. She closed her bedroom door, completely forgetting a slip of paper with the phone number written on it. It sat on the bed. She noticed that the rest of her family, perhaps preoccupied with their humiliation in front of the Morrises, still hadn't returned home. Madison took a taxi to the karaoke bar. When she got out, she found Jason leaning against the tree outside. She walked over to him, a smile brightening her face. Sorry, traffic was terrible, she commented, laughing lightly. Her face was flushed as if she had been running. She didn't like to lie. Of course, one or two lies would occasionally escape her lips, which always made her blush. The neon signs hanging in the windows of the bar dazzled Madison. They lit up the darkness on the sidewalk. Why aren't you inside? She asked Jason. Did you come out for some fresh air? Or are you hiding from all the drunk college kids inside? She smiled teasingly. She wasn't romantically or physically attracted to Jason, but she loved him as a friend. In her four years at college, Jason had never believed a single rumor that had been spread about her. He had always been there for her. The corners of Jason's mouth turned up in a smile. His eyes were filled with a reassuring gentleness. He had liked Madison for four whole years. From the first day he had met her, Jason had felt undeniably attracted to her. But he had been too slow to act. If he had told her how he felt right away, she might not have ended up with Luke Morris. She might not be married to someone else right now. But she'd been married to me. If only I'd been brave enough to tell her that I loved her, he thought. Jason's gaze made Madison slightly nervous. She sensed something coming, and she didn't want their relationship to be affected by any awkward emotions. Almost subconsciously, Madison moved slightly away from him toward the karaoke bar. She wanted the noise to block the conversation she knew was coming. Is Allie here too? Is she hogging the microphone as usual? Madison asked with a laugh, trying to steer the conversation in a different direction. All right, let's get in there. The street felt empty and depressing, and Madison longed to get inside, where it was warm and bustling with activity. But when she turned around, someone grabbed hold of her wrist. It was Jason. His grip was gentle but firm. Madison, I have something to tell you. Madison's heart skipped a beat. A gentle breeze swept between them as she looked at him. They were both so concentrated that neither of them noticed an SUV pull up to the curb. Jason gave Madison a meaningful look as he gathered his thoughts. He had to look down at her because, although she was wearing heels, she still only came up to his chin. Then he took a deep breath and spoke. Madison, I like you, he confessed. 
This was it. The one sentence he should have said four years ago. Madison hadn't expected Jason to be so direct. She looked up at the handsome man in front of her, completely surprised. Jason was a great guy. When she had been forced to marry, she'd even considered asking Jason to pretend to be her husband. But in the end, she met Ian. Jason went on, his voice filled with emotion. I fell in love with you the moment I saw you four years ago. You were at the school gate, dragging a huge suitcase behind you. I saw you from the basketball court, and I just knew that you were the one. I never knew what love was before I met you, but now I do. He stood there with bated breath. He held onto Madison's wrist, afraid of losing her. The day before I was going to tell you, years ago, news spread that you and Luke had gotten together. I was so sad. Jason stopped there, seemingly unable to go on. Madison had heard rumors that Jason had been in love with her for years. She would have never guessed that they were true. Jason took a deep breath. I can wait for you. And when you do finally break up with Luke, I'll be there for you. He had no idea that he had the situation all wrong. He continued obliviously. I know that you are committed to Luke. Even after what happened. When Luke cheated on you with your sister, you married Ian. The news of your marriage spread in just one day. Originally, it was just a rumor, but in the end, you admitted to it in front of the media. He had never dared to verify this, too afraid that the truth would be too difficult for him to bear. Madison, may I ask you something? Jason looked at her, his heart beating madly in his chest. Do I have a chance with you? He hadn't asked whether Madison wanted to be with her husband or not. In his opinion... Madison had been forced to marry. It seemed obvious to him that she would be unhappy in her marriage. He only wanted to know if he stood a chance with her. If he had to wait a few more years, so be it. As long as she says yes, I'll wait as long as it takes, he thought. However, simply wanting something wasn't enough to get it. Madison, a soft call instantly shattered the tense atmosphere. Jason quietly looked at Madison's dark eyes, which sparkled under the neon lights. She gazed back at him gravely, her lips trembling. He felt like his heart might stop at any moment. When he heard someone call her name, Jason looked in the direction of the voice. Madison's body stiffened. She knew this voice well. She realized with a start that Jason was still holding her gently by the wrist. She pushed her arm away and turned to face Ian who was standing by the car, one hand in his pocket. Ian wore a simple black V-neck t-shirt and khaki pants. He looked nonchalantly at Madison and Jason, seemingly unconcerned. Jason's heart felt heavy in his chest. Madison had been about to answer his question, a question that had weighed on him for the past four years, when Ian showed up. He felt a little embarrassed, but he didn't regret telling Madison how he felt. Madison didn't say anything. She stared at Ian blankly. They both looked at each other in silence. Jason stood there awkwardly, as if he were invisible. Ian, a voice suddenly called out behind him. That sounds a little like Lynn, Madison thought. Is that who it could be? The person walked out of the bar. Madison tried to keep a straight face, but she struggled to hide her feelings of dissatisfaction, and her face twitched slightly. Most bystanders wouldn't have caught it, but Jason clearly felt the change in Madison's energy. Ian caught the slight frown on Madison's face as well. He had been in a sour mood all day, which wasn't helping. From his awkward conversation with Zack, to Lynn's surprise appearance, it had been one difficult thing after another. Catching Madison talking to Jason, not to mention hearing Jason's confession, made Ian feel even worse. Ian narrowed his eyes. Ignoring Lynn, he was usually so calm, but looking over at Madison and seeing her upset made him feel protective of her. He was usually so calm, Ian was surprising himself. He took a few steps toward Madison and stood beside her. He wrapped his arms around her waist and felt her body stiffen. His heart sank into his stomach. However, even though he felt hurt, Ian still made sure to put on a smile. 
Madison, he said softly. Did you not tell Jason that you were married? Lynn walked up to the group, just barely catching what Ian had said. His question had stopped her in her tracks. She blinked her eyes and stole a glance at Madison. She would never have thought that she, originally her brother's girlfriend, was already married. Meanwhile, Jason was turning pale. It was one thing to hear the rumors, but hearing this with his ears was another thing entirely. He had been there for Madison for four years, and for four years he had been waiting for her to break up with Luke. They felt blindsided. He would have never expected Madison to not only break up with Luke, but to get married to a stranger right afterward as well. Madison finally raised her head and stole a look at her husband. It seemed he had changed his clothes, and she could even smell the fresh scent of shampoo on his hair. With Ian standing next to her, Madison finally felt like her mood was improving. As she stood there trying to figure out what to say, Ian turned to Jason. I'm sorry that you misunderstood my wife. We've already gotten our marriage certificate, and we're planning the wedding now. I hope you can come. His words were straightforward and amicable. They shattered Jason's thoughts, but they also completely settled Madison's mind. Jason turned to look at Madison. Perhaps because of what Ian had said, she had trouble looking back at him. He could tell she felt bad, and he felt like his heart was being cut in half. Jason forced a smile but didn't respond. Seeing his attempts to hide his emotions, Madison felt a little awkward. But whether or not Ian had appeared, she would have rejected Jason. In her opinion, they just really weren't suitable for each other. Jason, Madison pronounced softly, pleadingly. She didn't know what to say. She only hoped they could remain friends. Jason was stunned, but quickly came back to his senses. After taking a deep breath, he looked up. He smiled at Ian and Madison. Everyone's inside. I'm gonna go in. Come in whenever you're ready. Before Madison could reply, he turned around and disappeared behind the door to the karaoke bar. Lynn, standing beside them, suddenly exploded. You're married? She asked in disbelief. She pointed at Madison, unaware of how rude she was being. Her wide eyes fell on Ian. Ian, are you serious? You're married to her? Madison watched Lynn warily. She wasn't sure if Lynn knew that Ian was a Weston, but she did know that Lynn liked Ian. Still, it was impolite to question someone else's marriage in front of others. Not to mention that Madison already had a bad relationship with Lynn. But even if they had been friends, this encounter certainly would have put an end to that. Are you surprised? Madison asked. She looked into Lynn's eyes with obvious displeasure. I'm married to Ian. It's a legitimate marriage. We violated no laws, and there was no shady business behind any of this. Why are you so upset? Ian glanced at Madison in surprise, but she was only getting started. Lynn had awoken a tiger-like ferocity, and her dislike for Lynn was laid bare on her face. Ian looked like he might be sick. Hearing Madison's words, Lynn's entire body tensed. She felt like she might explode. She's unconvinced. Madison, you're a woman with a terrible reputation. How could you possibly be worthy of Ian? He's an outstanding person. Are you saying my worth depends on your opinion of me? Madison snapped, interrupting her. She wasn't in the mood to listen to this gibberish. Anger flooded her chest, intense and volatile. She glared at Lynn. I'm sorry, but Ian doesn't like you. And, as it turns out, this person you say isn't good enough is the person he chose to marry. Lynn wanted to rip Madison apart. How can she be so arrogant? She wondered. You're completely shameless, Lynn roared. Ian was clearly prepared to... Lynn! Ian snapped, cutting her off. Lynn stopped short, her anger instantly dissipating as she cast Madison a sly, sidelong glance. Don't speak nonsense, Ian said softly, ignoring Lynn's petty looks. With just that one sentence, Madison was thrown completely off balance. Don't speak nonsense? Did he say that because Lynn told me I'm shameless, or was it something else? Madison turned her eyes toward Ian, 
feeling slightly suspicious. To her relief, his face was set. It was determined and serious. It was an expression that a casual onlooker would have thought nothing of. But to Madison, who had been feeling self-doubt, it was everything. She was overjoyed. She felt like her heart might bubble over. Oh, Ian, so you do still care about me after all. Lynn pressed her lips tightly together and glared at Ian, but his grave face made her hesitant to finish her thought. Ian had clearly been with Claire. Lynn had liked Ian even back then, and she liked him now, too. Even though he was merely a doctor, she still always had a crush on him. She had heard that he was going to propose to Claire, but then Claire was recruited by a German ballet company. She had gone away for a while, and after she returned... She and Ian inexplicably broke up. Lynn had been certain that her opportunity had come. But, just as she had been about to try her luck with Ian, she had learned of his sudden elopement. It was the last thing she would have expected of him. This sucks. How could he get married at the drop of a hat? To someone he doesn't even know. Lynn felt so wrong. The world really owes me one, she thought furiously. Tears fell from her face in uncontrollable streams, and her lips trembled. Ian, why did you marry her? If you had wanted to get married, why couldn't that person be me? Or have you never really liked me? She asked. Madison couldn't help but roll her eyes. Of course, everyone had the right to pursue love and also confess their love. But Lynn was using her confession to try to manipulate Ian and sabotage their marriage. However... Her line of thinking seemed so far-fetched to Madison. Does she really think that the Earth revolves around her? Lynn had recently realized that she had a crush on Ian for many years. Ian should be mine, she thought self-righteously. Ian, we've known each other for two years. Have you never thought about me romantically? Lynn had never felt so wrong. In her opinion, Ian was being harsh and unfair to her. She felt like it was all Madison's fault. He had never been this strong-headed before. She looked at Ian softly, but seeing Madison made her heart burn with a fierce fire. Did she seduce you? She asked him. She's shameless. I'm sure everyone knows how depraved she is. Ian, don't let her fool you. I know all about the real Madison. She used to be with my brother. Madison had no interest in listening to Lynn. Ian already knew her past relationship with Luke. He wouldn't care about that. Therefore, Madison stared straight ahead, keeping Lynn and Ian only in her peripheral vision. She couldn't deny that she was at least a little curious to see what Ian would do next. Ian was shocked by Lynn's sudden confession, but he quickly recovered. He had no clue that Lynn felt this way about Madison. Her sour mood suddenly made a whole lot more sense to him. With his head lowered, he raised his eyes, and stole a glance at Madison. Lynn was still crying. Lynn, Ian said in a low, impartial voice, I've always treated you as I would treat a good friend. His response cut off Lynn's spiraling thoughts. Madison, too, suddenly realized that Ian had witnessed two love confessions in a single day. Lynn's love for him and Jason's love for her. Madison turned her head. She couldn't get herself to look at Ian or Lynn. However, she did feel a bit soothed by Ian's words. At least she didn't feel as helpless as when she had met Lynn outside the Griffin. Ian searched Madison's face. Seeing that her mood had obviously improved with his support, he finally realized why she had been in a bad mood the whole day. He couldn't help but smile. His deep voice rang out into the night air, carrying with it a bewitching charm. I'm already married to Madison, he reminded Lynn. Our official wedding ceremony is coming up. If you have time, you should come. He gently held Madison around the waist. Lynn, you and I can only be friends. Even if I weren't married, that would still be the case. I hope you'll treat my wife with respect in the future. Madison's heart calmed entirely. 
She was, after all, an easily satisfied woman. She was like a child in that just a few words of support could cure a bad mood. But her innocence didn't mean that she was naive. Her husband always seemed to know exactly what she needed. She could always count on him to cheer her up. Ian turned away from Lynn and spoke to Madison. Isn't today your class get-together? You should go in and enjoy yourself. I'll walk you inside. Madison smiled and nodded. She was happy with Ian and how he stood up for her. Meanwhile, Lynn watched helplessly as Ian and Madison walked away. Her eyes were filled with a deep loathing. Why? 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 How could that miserable woman be married to Ian? She thought furiously. Lynn had fallen for Ian the very first time she met him. Even though he was only a doctor. Even though he was below her social class. She loved him without hesitation. Sometimes her feelings for him overwhelmed her. She was the second child in the Morris family and stood to inherit half of the Morris Corporation. She was beautiful and an accomplished dancer to boot. She was talented and intelligent and bound to marry rich, yet she'd fallen for a poor doctor like Ian. It was a classic star-crossed lover's tale, the rich young lady who falls in love with the poor scholar. It struck her as very romantic. But why is Ian with Madison? Lynn's heart burned with hatred, dissatisfaction, and an unwillingness to believe that this was really happening. She always got her way. She would make sure that one day, Ian would become hers. Ian dropped Madison off at the door of the private karaoke room. He stretched out his hand and tucked some stray hairs behind Madison's ears. He murmured, I came here to meet with a few colleagues for drinks. Call me when you're done later, and we can leave together. Madison nodded. She had thought that Ian had shown up to talk to Lynn. Now that she knew he was just meeting up with friends, she felt a bit silly. I totally overthink everything, she thought, kicking herself for her sensitivity. She gazed straight into Ian's glimmering eyes, smiling and pursing her lips. The small dimples on her cheeks punctuated her face. Madison, Ian asked softly, did you feel jealous at all today? It was as if Ian had dropped a bomb on her. Even in the dim light of the karaoke bar, Madison's face looked as red as a beet. Her eyes dashed nervously back and forth. Ian thought she looked very cute. The smile on his face grew bigger and bigger. He couldn't help it. Just as he was about to say something, Madison pushed him away. You should go meet up with your friends. I'm going in. She didn't look back to gauge Ian's reaction. She quickly entered the private room, leaving him standing there. She couldn't help but laugh. Before she had time to settle her emotions, Madison saw that the entire room was filled with drunk classmates. They drank with wild abandon, as if it were their last days on Earth. Allie saw that Madison had arrived and carried the microphone over to her. The whole room was bustling. People screeched to the music, falling over each other in drunken displays of friendship. It was certainly going to be a memorable end to college life. But each of them seemed to be having a different experience. Some students seemed overjoyed, and some seemed to be mourning the end of school. Others seemed preoccupied with their worries. Allie, Jason, and Madison were all perfect examples of this. Madison didn't look for Jason. It was as if the two of them had an unspoken agreement not to speak. They were both in the room enjoying the party separately and pretending nothing had happened between them. They were trying to operate under the belief that a problem wouldn't exist if you didn't talk about it. But reality crept behind both of them like a shadow. Back at the Weston household the next morning, Diana got home from exercising to find Ian eating breakfast at the dining table. Suddenly, her eyes lit up like a tiger eyeing some meat. She sped across the room much faster than an average old 76-year-old woman could. She sat down next to Ian, her eyes bright like stars. Ian, my dear grandson, Madison, come back to spend time with me, she asked him softly. I know she's busy and you're busy. You know what I really want, a little great-grandchild to play with. Ian slurped some cereal off his spoon and turned his head to look at her. Grandma, 
you're getting ahead of yourself, he replied softly. How could I possibly give you a great-grandson or granddaughter just now? Madison has yet to graduate, and the wedding isn't even fully planned. Can you blame me? Diana lowered her head in disappointment. After you messed around for years, how can you expect me to be patient now that you're married? Who asked you to keep such a low profile? If you're willing to cooperate, then shouldn't we be able to arrange the wedding easily? Your mother has already been busy. On the other hand, you and Madison haven't had your wedding photos taken yet. Ian stopped eating breakfast for a moment. He looked straight ahead as if remembering something. Diana was a smart person. With just one look, she could tell that Ian had probably forgotten about the whole matter. She smiled sweetly and said, We have a wonderful family photographer. No need to search for anyone. Hurry up now and let me take your wedding photos. My skills aren't just for show, you know. I'll make you two look fabulous. Ian turned his head. Diana's confident smile finally convinced him. He had to admit that her photography skills were not bad. In fact, most would consider her quite talented. Diana was excited to get started. It had been a long time since she had had fun. Besides, it was a big deal to her that she could help her dear grandson with his pre-wedding photos. I'd better make sure that my camera still works well, she thought happily. Meanwhile, Madison had no idea that Ian had agreed to this. When he called her over to the hospital that afternoon, she assumed it was about some trivial matter, like buying something for the reception. It wasn't until Ian finished his work and took her to the Weston's house that Madison found out about it. Diana had requested that she stay with the Westons for the next three days. Just for some pre-wedding photos, Madison thought incredulously. Madison had no objections to Diana taking the pictures, and wasn't upset that Ian had neglected to tell her about this matter. She didn't even have a problem with Olivia dragging her to all the wedding planning meetings. But why hadn't anyone warned her that she would have to stay in the Weston Mansion for three days? Did they assume that this was what I wanted? Did they even think about me at all? She wondered desperately. Besides, Ian always left early and returned late. She would be on her own in the house. What am I going to do? When Madison heard the news, she looked at Ian. She had been hoping he would reject the plan, but he didn't say a thing. She felt like running. Grandma, Madison said softly, inwardly reminding herself to be thick-skinned. I'm afraid that I shouldn't stay here before the wedding. Just the news gets out, and the media gets an idea that Ian is a part of Weston family, and I am married to him before the real announcement, she asked cautiously. Diana smiled jovially and waved her hand. What are you afraid of? We don't have to explain to anyone. She responded. Madison didn't know what to say. She was at a total loss for words. Diana even ordered Ian to call Zach and tell him that Madison would be staying with them. And so it was decided. She would sleep in Ian's room when he would temporarily stay in a guest room. Although Madison was a little afraid of the Westons, she had to admit that they had treated her very well the last time she had stayed there. They were hospitable and they had done everything they could to make her feel comfortable. She carefully packed a small suitcase and moved into Ian's family home. But if she could have known how her stay would turn out, she never would have stayed with him. For everywhere she turned, there was Diana. Whenever she slept, Diana woke her up. Whenever she ate, Diana sat down at the table. Whenever she bathed, Diana barged into the bathroom to get something. Soon enough, Madison couldn't take it anymore. If Diana kept appearing and interrupting her, she would lose it. Whenever Ian was around, she luckily didn't disturb Madison. He seemed to know where Diana was at all times and could help Madison avoid her. But Ian wasn't there all the time, and Madison's mental health was being stretched thin. On her second day at the Westons, Madison didn't see Ian, something that had become a pattern. 
She followed Olivia and Diana around, going shopping for the wedding. The three of them stepped into a famous dress boutique. Everyone was in a good mood. Madison regaled Olivia, Diana, and the store workers with stories, making all of them laugh so hard that they barely closed their mouths. She had always been a good conversationalist. It was easy for her to charm people. After Olivia had bought herself a dress, Madison suggested that they go to a coffee shop to rest. She was tired and figured that Diana would definitely need a break. They ordered their coffees, and then Madison and Olivia went together to the restroom. On their way back, they saw Diana sitting at the table, looking at the pedestrians passing by outside. She was zeroing in on a young husband and wife, walking with what seemed to be their parents. Madison was puzzled. She walked over and asked softly, Grandma, what are you looking at? Diana turned her head around and smiled, revealing all the wrinkles on her face. I'm just looking outside, she said casually. You should know that it's been a long time since I've been out like this. I've always loved watching people. Madison wasn't sure that she believed her. Diana clearly didn't want to say what was actually on her mind and Madison wasn't going to force her. The three of them soon left and went to a men's clothing store. Madison kept peering over her shoulder. She felt uneasy, though she didn't know why. Diana and Olivia noticed her slight paranoia, but they only smiled and ignored it. Madison? A gentle voice called out. What are you doing here? Are you shopping too? The voice was slightly condescending, but it was masked as amicable. Madison lifted her eyes and saw Kelsey. She couldn't say she was surprised. Only Kelsey would speak to her in such a patronizing way. Diana and Olivia turned their heads to gauge Madison's reaction, but her face remained impassive as she watched her sister walk over, holding Luke's hand. Her makeup was exquisite, and her smile was warm and gracious. Kelsey looked at Olivia and Diana suspiciously. She discreetly glanced at their shopping bags and noticed a logo she had never seen before. It belonged to the store where Olivia had bought her dress and looked exclusive. Madison, haven't you been home recently? Kelsey asked. I've been waiting for you every day. She gave Madison a worried look. She acted as if she was concerned about her sister, but it also sounded like she was mocking her. Mom and Dad are both really upset. Where are you staying? Hello, I'm Madison's younger sister, she said sweetly to Olivia and Diana. My name is Kelsey. Madison could barely keep from laughing out loud when she saw Kelsey's act. Once again, she was playing the good younger sister. Diana's brows were tightly knitted together in an expression of dissatisfaction. Looking between Madison and Kelsey, she asked, Who did you say you are? Since Madison had been staying at Diana's place, and rarely saw her sister. She wasn't worried about any backlash from Kelsey for once. She was also curious to see how Diana would handle her. Grandmother, this is Kelsey, my half-sister, she said with a polite smile. Kelsey frowned. When Stella married into the Greenwald family, it was considered a big deal. In fact, it was even considered a scandal. Everyone knew about John's affair. Madison's revelation that she and Kelsey were half-sisters was meant to make Kelsey feel ashamed. Luke scowled. He had never known Madison to be so passive-aggressive. He wondered where the animosity was coming from. Luke had a bad habit of not seeing the forest for the trees, and in this case, he couldn't see that Kelsey's regular cruelty was what was driving Madison's aggression. You're the younger daughter of the Greenwald family, Olivia asked. It seemed like she remembered a little bit about what had happened back when Kelsey was born. The disdain in her eyes was obvious. Her posture, too, revealed contempt. She immediately turned to Madison and said, Abandoning the darkness and joining the light was a good move. Madison almost laughed out loud. Or am I only learning now how sharp-witted and sassy Olivia is? Does Luke represent the dark? Is Ian the light? She wondered. The truth about the sisters' mothers was common knowledge in the Weston family. 
Luke not get this mockery? Madison wondered. She noticed that his face had turned slightly pale. You two must be Ian's mother and grandmother. My name is Luke. I'm the manager of the Morris Corporation. I believe Ian and I have met a few times, he stated. Diana stood her teeth as if disgusted by him. Madison was part of the Weston family now, and the Westons took care of their own. Luke had assumed that once he revealed his identity as a manager of the Morris Corporation, Olivia and Diana would feel ashamed for the way they were ignoring him. But they still weren't taking him seriously. He tried a different strategy and put on a cheerful attitude. Madison always thought that Ian was a really good man, and if her family's social standing wasn't so high, a doctor who saves lives would be a real catch. But I have something I'd like to share with you. Madison looked unhappy. Out of the corner of her eye, she caught Luke glancing at her. Madison, you're the oldest daughter in your family, he said. If you want to be with Ian, you need to remember your place in the Greenwald family. Luke lowered his head and looked at the shopping bag in Olivia's hand. He assumed that Madison was using Greenwald's money to fund the Weston family. I know about the agreement you've reached with the Westons. I wish you nothing but happiness. Luke was ready to turn around and leave when he suddenly heard a mocking voice behind him. The Morris Corporation dares to show off in front of a woman like me? Diana exclaimed. I've been too gentle just now. Diana had never been so furious before, but it was only for a moment. After all, Diana was old, and she had learned long ago what was worth making a fuss over, and what wasn't. I want to see what these people's faces look like when my grandson and his wife hold their wedding celebration. She angrily pulled Madison and Olivia aside and turned around to leave. Being talked down to in public by an old woman didn't feel good. Kelsey and Luke felt scorned. They looked at each other, and a silent understanding passed between them that they couldn't let Madison and her new family get the best of them. They had to humiliate Madison and Ian in some way. Seeing they were about to go, Kelsey shouted, Madison, I'm getting married the day after tomorrow. You're coming, right? At the Reddington? Right next to the Pink Star Hotel. Luke's family booked an entire floor. Kelsey and Luke swelled with pride as they saw the envious gazes of the passerby who had overheard them. Their venue was located right next to the Pink Star Hotel and was a place that most people couldn't afford. It was second best only to the Pink Star, which only families like the Westons and the Thompsons could afford. Any of the other wealthy families had to settle with the Reddington. Nevertheless, it was still a really swanky place that most people could only dream of going to. Diana perked up upon hearing this. She turned around and pointed at them. Two are hilarious, she said to Olivia. Olivia laughed insincerely, but Diana seemed not to notice. She smirked. Olivia, dear, you give them a copy of the wedding invitations we just printed yesterday. After all... A sister should be there for her older sister's wedding. Olivia raised her eyebrows in mild surprise and pulled an invitation from her bag. The one she pulled out was from the first batch. There was a light blue bow on the outside of a gold and silver wedding invitation. Simple and elegant, this was the signature color scheme of the Weston family. Madison took the invitation gently from Olivia's hand. She wanted to deliver it personally. She passed it to Luke and Kelsey. I hope that when I get married, all of you can come and watch the ceremony, Madison asserted. Of course, I will come to your wedding, Luke said with a calm and collected attitude. Kelsey still had a smug look on her face. She reached out and pulled the wedding invitation from Madison's hand. She flipped it over and asked her, Does she really have the money to pay for a wedding? It won't be worth wasting all your money at one party. As she spoke, she saw what the invite said. Kelsey's eyes suddenly opened wide. The invitation trembled in her hand. Madison, your wedding reception is at the Pink Star Hotel? When Luke heard this, his face turned pale. He snatched the invitation from Kelsey's hand and looked at it in shock. He felt his chest tense up. 
it was suddenly a little difficult to breathe. The invitation clearly stated that Madison and Ian were the bride and groom. He could no longer pretend it wasn't happening. The facts were right in front of him. Luke felt so uncomfortable. Madison, must you marry Ian? Don't you think you'll regret it? He asked inwardly. Madison nodded. She turned around and stood next to Olivia and Diana. Luke gripped the card in his palm, crumpling it. His intensity was honestly a little frightening. Madison, I will wait and see if you actually end up marrying him. Soon enough, you'll come back to me, begging for forgiveness. You'll be mine soon enough, he thought. Diana and Olivia were unfazed by their run-in with Luke and Kelsey. The three women walked around the shopping mall carefree and excited. They didn't return to the Weston house until close to dinner time. Diana lay down to rest for a bit after they returned. She was exhausted from the day. Olivia seemed to have something to discuss with Edward, so she disappeared with him. Madison went to her room and looked online for jobs to apply to. After all... I'll have to start my career soon, right? She thought. While she was browsing the web, her phone rang. It was an unfamiliar number. She didn't answer. Madison had a habit of not picking up calls from numbers she didn't recognize. But a moment later, the phone rang again. She hesitated before finally picking up. Hello? Madison asked softly. Madison, it's Lynn. The woman's voice sounded a little grave. It gave Madison a bad feeling. Where are you right now? I'm trying to find you. Lynn spoke. Just say what you want to say over the phone. I'm already in bed. Madison didn't want to meet Lynn in person, and claiming it was too late was the perfect excuse. Lynn's cold laugh came over the line. Madison, if you marry Ian, I'll make sure you regret it. Just try me, she threatened. Madison's face hardened. The Greenwalds had refused to help with the wedding, and now it seems the Morris family didn't want her to marry Ian either. Lynn, I need you to understand something. My marriage with Ian is solely between the two of us. No matter what, it has nothing to do with you. Not to mention the fact that Ian doesn't like you. And even if he did, he would only like you as a friend. If you do anything to upset him, I will make sure you regret it. Madison's voice was filled with cold loathing. It seemed like so many people didn't want her to marry Ian. She was sick of worrying about others sticking their noses into her business. Madison went on. Opinion, do you think Ian would have of you if he knew that you called me to tell me this? Lynn felt silent for a moment, but then her soft laughter came back over the line. The sound made Madison tremble with anger. What are you laughing at? she thought furiously. Soon enough, Lynn was laughing so hard that it was difficult to catch her breath. After a long while, she finally calmed down enough to ask, Madison, do you think Ian is with you because he loves you? Do you think that's a bit naive of you? Madison clenched her phone so tightly that her fingertips turned white. No matter how intelligent or clever she was, one possibility kept her up at night. It was the possibility that Ian didn't love her. She feared that it might be true. It was suddenly so clear to her. Their relationship was just a momentary infatuation on Ian's part. She didn't know why Ian was willing to marry her, or even why he was protecting her. Zack couldn't protect her, and she couldn't protect herself either. The Greenwald family would rip her apart until there was nothing left. It was like living with a pack of hungry wolves every day. Hearing nothing but silence on the other end of the line, Lynn knew she had gotten the reaction she had wanted. She felt a twisted sense of pride. Then she spoke to Madison softly, putting on an air of tenderness. Oh, Madison, I really feel for you. Even if Ian doesn't like me, at least he respects me enough to straightforwardly reject me. The way I see it, he was protecting me. But what about you? I heard that you two are married because my brother doesn't want you anymore. 
I don't know how you got on Ian's good side. She's talking about Ian, the man she's been pining over for two years. How could she be so willing to let him go? Does she just want to make me feel insecure? Madison thought. You're the least important member of the Green Wolf. Can you really compare yourself to someone like me? I'm the favorite of the Morris family. My parents and brother have always doted on me ever since I was a child. Maybe we should make a bet. Lynn trailed off, her speech turning into biting laughter. She got a hold of herself and continued, Let's make a bet. Soon do you think before you and Ian will get a divorce? Madison's face went ashen, and her chest heaved up and down violently. She wanted to hang up the phone, but some masochistic part of her needed to continue listening. For some reason, she felt that it was important to hear these things. Lynn was enjoying herself by that point. Let me guess, she said nonchalantly. About three months. Or is that too long? Maybe just a week? She laughed cruelly. Madison gripped her blanket in frustration. Lynn, what exactly are you trying to do? Are you just trying to threaten or scare me? If so, you'll have to try harder than this, she replied. Lynn snickered. I hope you're prepared for the wedding. I can't wait to see the look on your face when he abandons you. Lynn hung up as soon as she finished talking. Madison helplessly let the phone drop by the bed. She bit her lip. Inexplicably, a name suddenly appeared in Madison's mind. Claire. She remembered Lynn mentioning the name to Ian. Madison's mind was a mess. Did Ian love this woman, Claire? Was their relationship serious? Do I have to leave if she comes back? She wondered. Because she didn't know anything for certain, she could only make random guesses. She might have been entirely wrong about everything. Suddenly... She heard a key turn in the lock downstairs. Madison jumped. After some moments, she heard someone enter. Madison's throat felt dry all of a sudden. She desperately wanted to go downstairs and pour herself a glass of ice-cold water. She walked over to the door. It was Olivia and Edward who had returned. The two of them went into the living room. They were silent for a while until Olivia spoke. Is Madison asleep? Madison, hearing her question stopped in her tracks. Just as she was about to close the door to her room, she heard Olivia say, Edward, do you really think that Ian will stay married to Madison? Madison was stunned. She crept downstairs and stood quietly in the hallway, holding her breath. She couldn't let them find out that she was eavesdropping. She hid behind a large vase in the hallway. Edward also seemed surprised that Olivia would ask such a question, but he still replied evenly. Well, they already have their marriage certificate, right? You don't think Ian would go back on his word? Olivia opened her mouth but didn't say anything. Then she sighed. I only know that Ian had been dating a woman for two years before he met Madison. I'd always thought that he would marry her. I just don't understand what changed his mind. Olivia, Edward said sternly. Without thinking, he turned his head to look upstairs. Since Madison was still living with them, he didn't want her to hear what they were saying. He also knew the worry that festered in Olivia's heart. Some things are over, and there's nothing you can do. Try not to worry so much. Olivia sighed. I'm just afraid that Ian will regret this in the future. Olivia and Edward fell silent. They remained in the living room together for a while before heading to their room to sleep. Neither noticed the figure standing in the hallway, obscured by a large face. Madison's entire body was trembling. She stood stock still, unable to move from the spot behind the vase. Her face was as pale as blank paper. Her hands, hanging by her sides, were clenched into fists. The doubts that Lynn had given rise to were now confirmed by Ian's parents. So Olivia is afraid that Ian will regret marrying me. She thought despondently. It turned out that Ian had had a girlfriend for two years. If we continue our relationship, what will happen when that woman appears? Madison wondered anxiously. More specifically, what will Ian do? Will I come to regret everything? Now that she knew Ian had feelings for someone else, she wondered if she still had it in her heart to proceed with the wedding. Even though the Westons didn't believe in divorce, 
She wouldn't put it past them to push for a divorce for the sake of their own son's happiness. She could guess this just by listening to Olivia's words. Madison had no clue what to think or what to do. In the silent Weston mansion, Madison curled into a ball. She sat on the floor and hugged her knees tightly to her chest. She felt like a lost child, trying desperately to find direction in life. Ian, you had a girlfriend that you dated for two years, and your relationship was still good. Why did you agree to my proposal? Why did you lie to me? Why did you make me think that we could make it work? Why did you make me so dependent on you? Why did you make me care for you so much? She thought and kept mumbling in her head. However, even though she had so many questions, she didn't dare to ask either Ian or his family. Still, she needed answers. Suddenly, Madison thought of a person who could be able to tell her more about the Weston family. The next morning, Madison packed her things and prepared to go home. Over the three days she had stayed with the Westons, she and Ian had barely seen each other. Even when they had, there had been other people around. She had been quite comfortable there, despite having Diana breathing down her neck the whole time. When she came downstairs, Ian's family smiled and greeted her, as if what she had heard the night before was never said at all. Don't worry about the wedding, dear. Diana said, taking her hand. Olivia and I have almost everything prepared for you. All you need to do is relax and wait for your big day. Don't you worry about anything. She winked at her. Trust me, I'll give you plenty of things to worry about after the ceremony. Madison smiled shyly and looked away. Olivia and Edward hugged her and said their goodbyes before asking their chauffeur, Kenneth, to take her home. She had not been in the car long before she got a call from Ian... Are you on your way? he asked. It felt like it had been so long since she had heard his voice, that hearing it now made her heart clench. I'm in the car, she replied. Kenneth's taking me home. I've been swamped lately, he spoke after an awkward pause. As soon as things calm down, I'll come and find you. He sounded tired, and his voice was thick with tension. Madison smiled slightly, but didn't say anything. She was quiet long enough for Ian to assume there was a problem with their connection. Madison? He called out. I'm here, she said. I know you have a couple of major surgeries coming up, so focus on that. Kelsey's wedding is coming up, and she'll need some help at home, Madison explained. Ian could tell something was wrong, but he didn't know what the problem was. He murmured his assent and ended the call. Madison asked Kenneth to drop her off at Silverwood, where she was meeting Zack so that they could go to dinner. He simply nodded. Zack was already waiting at the curb when they arrived, and Kenneth helped her out of the car and drove away without having spoken for the entirety of the ride. She stood in front of Zack nervously, feeling like a helpless child. She remembered when Stella had brought him home for the first time. Madison had known nothing of betrayal then. She had just been a lonely little girl with no mother or siblings. Her father had always been cold to her, but when John moved Stella and Zack into their home, she had naively thought he had found a mom and a big brother just for her. Reality was that she became an outsider in her own home, especially after Kelsey and Alex were born. Still, Zack had been the only person in her family who had ever shown her that he loved her, and she had trusted him more than anyone in the world. With a jolt, she realized that the little boy who used to hide behind her parents had grown into a strong, confident man. I'm so proud of you, she thought. Hey, she said softly. Zack had been surprised to get her call, and he had cleared his schedule for the day just for her. Having grown up with her, he could tell something was on her mind. He took her hand and walked her over to his car. I'm starving, he said. Are you? Let's get something to eat, he suggested. She nodded. When she was with Zack, she could ignore everything and just quietly hide behind him. He made her feel in a way that her parents never had. They hardly spoke through dinner. He waited until she had finished eating before asking the question that had been on his mind since she had stepped out of the Weston's car. Mads, what's going on with you? 
She looked down at the table and folded her hands on her lap. Zack recognized this as one of her defensive postures, and his face sank slightly. He could tell from her body language that she was uneasy. She had learned from a young age to look calm and composed to hide the fact that she was hurt or scared and needed help. He had watched her shut down like this before. What do you know about Ian? She asked after letting out a deep breath. About his past? Zack frowned and stood up. Without saying a word, he threw a wad of bills onto the table and reached out to take her hand. Startled by the dark look on his face, she let him lead her out of the restaurant. Zack, wait, listen to... He ignored her. He didn't feel like listening to her defend the people he thought were bullying her. She stopped him when they got to his car. Can we talk about this, please? She pleaded. Get in the car, Madison, he snarled. She shook her head. If I get in the car, there are only two roads we'll take, she thought. One leads to a divorce lawyer, and the other leads to Ian. I'm not ready to take either one just yet. Zach's frown deepened. She was scared, but she mustered up the courage to stand up to him. Can you just talk to me? She asked miserably. I just want to know about his past. I'm sick of being kept in the dark. He froze. He had never known her to be so passive. Madison desperately needed someone to talk to, but she couldn't say anything about the Westons just yet. Not even to Zach. I knew he had a girlfriend, she said. I just want to know why they broke up. Can you stop being so mad at me about this and talk to me like an adult? His face softened. Nads, you're my sister, he said with a sigh and stepped away from the car. When did you lose your self-confidence? She wasn't sure how to respond. If I tell him that I actually care about Ian, he'll probably get mad again, she thought. What do I say? He looked into her eyes and couldn't bear to scold her. Who told you? He asked softly. So it's true. It's true, and you've known the entire time. This is why you didn't want me to stay married to him. I bet it doesn't have anything to do with family at all, she thought, reeling. Tell me what's going on, she said, her voice soft but firm. They stared at each other over the roof of the car like statues. Neither moved nor spoke for what felt like minutes. Finally, Zack sighed helplessly. It's all in the past, Madison, he said. She didn't say anything. She just stared at him and waited for an answer. He did have a girlfriend, he told her. He barely spoke above a whisper, but his voice carried through the parking lot, and each word weighed on Madison's heart. They were together for more than two years, but he never told her who he really was. When he proposed, she turned him down. Madison felt her heart drop. She hadn't known how close Ian had come to getting married before they met. I don't know why they broke up, Zack said. I know her last name's Thompson, and there are rumors that their families had arranged the marriage before all of this went down. She never knew that Ian's a Weston. Her face crumbled into a scowl as she bit back a bitter laugh. Another arranged marriage. They fell in love under a veil of family secrets, and those secrets broke them up. What happens when the truth comes out? Where does that leave Ian and me? She thought. Madison suddenly felt very cold. What kind of man have I married? What kind of woman am I turning into? She wondered. She took a long, deep breath and tried to calm herself down. Does he know about this? Does he know he was being groomed to marry her? Zack shook his head. Daniel says he doesn't. He said with a shrug. He paused and looked away. She knew there was more he wasn't telling her. As she waited for him to spit it out, she tried not to feel like the sky was falling in on her. The day you and Ian got married, he said, unable to look at her, was the day they broke up. Hearing this, Madison was speechless. Madison's head was spinning. She felt as if she were falling from the great height and floating in the air at the same time. Her mind went blank except for one image, one face. Ian. He had almost been married. She hadn't let herself think too much about why he had agreed to her proposal so readily. 
I guess I just kept telling myself that he had his reasons. Maybe he was being forced to marry by his family like I was. Maybe he was just tired of being single. Maybe he was just bored, she thought. She had come up with thousands of reasons, but she had never expected the truth would be like this. She tried to imagine how his breakup had happened. It played out in her head in a series of flashes, like a photo montage. Flash, he says he needs to ask her something. Flash, he pulls out a small box holding a diamond ring from his pocket. Flash, he feels like the happiest man in the world. Flash, she says no and walks away from him. And then I show up with my ridiculous proposal, Madison thought, when she could think again. Had he agreed on impulse? Or had it been a moment of anger and hurt? She leaned against the car door, her breath coming in little gasps. Her heart felt like it was being crushed inside her chest as she fought to breathe. She tried not to give in to wild conspiracy theories. I need to calm down and think, she told herself. But I need to know why he agreed to marry me. And I need to know what he's capable of in the future. Mads. Zack's voice sounded like it was coming from far away, and she realized he was hugging her. He opened her door and helped her into the car. Are you okay? he asked. She couldn't speak. She leaned against the headrest and closed her eyes. With a deep sigh, Zack got in and started the car. He didn't take her to Mercy Hospital or a divorce lawyer, though. He took her to the beach instead. With the windows open and the warm sea air blowing in, Madison's breath became deeper and more even. Zack pulled onto a bluff, and they sat in the car without speaking. After a few minutes, Zack broke the silence. What are you going to do? he asked. She shook her head and looked out the window. What am I going to do? Pretend to not know anything about it and dive into my marriage without hesitation? Or should I cut my losses and walk away, despite the Westons disdain for divorce, she thought. The only thing she knew for certain was that she was terrified. She was worried that Ian was just using her as a shield or a crutch against a broken heart. I'm just a substitute. I'm an understudy who never learned my lines. And now I'm on stage, and I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. She continued thinking. What do you think I should do? She asked, her voice almost drowned out by the ocean. It's your life, Mads, he said after a long pause. It's not up to me. I already tried bossing you around, which didn't solve a thing. Her eyes snapped open. He was right. It was her life. No matter what choice she made, she had to be the one to make it. She nodded. Yeah, I know. Let me think about it for a while. Zack studied her profile sadly, but he didn't say anything else. He started the car and took her home. Kelsey was getting married the next day and there was a lot to do. When she saw Madison walk into the house, Chelsea's eyes burned with spite. She was standing on a little platform in the center of the living room in her wedding gown, while Stella circled her like a shark, to adjust a fold here and a pleat there. She got the pink star, Kelsey seized. Her wedding's going to be at the pink star. I thought Luke was supposed to be the best thing that ever happened to her. That's why I took him. But now she's got Ian in the best wedding venue in the city. She fought to stay calm and swallow her anger. Invitation real, she asked Madison through a forced smile. Are you really having your wedding at the Pink Star Hotel? I'm so jealous. Madison was in no mood to placate her sister. She just rolled her eyes and headed toward the stairs. She was almost out of sight when she heard Stella hiss at Kelsey. She's messing with you, Kelsey. That invitation was probably a mock-up or something. Imagine some surgeon having enough money or influence to hold a wedding there. You can't take it seriously. He's just playing off his last name and hoping no one asks too many questions. She fussed with Kelsey's gown. Besides, there's no way she'll be able to have her wedding there. What do you mean? Kelsey asked distantly, admiring the diamond necklace the Morrises had sent as a bridal gift. Madison froze where she was and listened intently. The real Westons are already throwing a wedding at the Pink Star that day, Stella said with a scornful little smile. One of the younger sons is getting married, so they bought out the entire place. Kelsey smiled, relieved. 
the invitation must be a fake. Some sad attempt to steal a little class by some nobody doctor who's embarrassed that he can't afford a wedding. Madison's used to being a nobody, so it's a perfect match, she thought nastily. They've bought out the place. The words rang in Madison's ears, and she couldn't help but sneer. Since learning a little bit about Ian's past, she'd been worried that the Westons might want to stall the wedding. But Ian had already been planning to propose to his girlfriend, so at least some of the arrangements would have been made in advance. There's no way she could have known that those arrangements had been made for someone else, or that she would be a replacement bride. Kelsey noticed that Madison was still in the room. It's all my fault, Mom, she said. If I had stopped her, things wouldn't have turned out this way. She put on a theatrically guilty expression. She had been in a funk for the last two days, but now that the question at the Pink Star Hotel had been resolved, and that she wasn't in danger of being upstaged, she was in a much better mood. I was just feeling so guilty for getting married before my big sister. We should drop it. Stella smiled at her daughter with pride. Kelsey's ability to assess any situation and turn it to her advantage pleased her immensely. The Morris family is never going to know what hit them, Stella thought triumphantly. Madison rolled her eyes and left the room. She didn't bother trying to explain the wedding invitation. She didn't see the point. It was just easier to pretend that Kelsey and her mother didn't exist. Zack had watched the whole scene unfold with a frown, but hadn't intervened. There was a pang in his heart for poor Madison as he watched her go upstairs. Did you invite Daniel Weston to your sister's wedding? Stella asked him. Is he coming? Kelsey pretended to fiddle with her jewelry, but made sure to listen in. She had originally hoped to get close to Daniel through Zack, and Stella had even made John invite him to dinner on several occasions. It turned out, though, that the only Greenwald Daniel seemed interested in being close to was Zack, so Kelsey had been forced to set her sights on the other prey. Still, a girl can dream, she thought. She had a little day dream that Daniel would come to the wedding and be so dazzled by her beauty that he would steal her away like some fairy tale prince. Her heart pounded when she imagined it. I sent him an invitation, Zack said, frowning slightly. But whether he shows up or not isn't on me. He turned to leave, but Stella grabbed his arm. What are you talking about? Your friends? He'll come if you personally invite him. Don't be so formal. Let's call him now and invite him to come over tomorrow for... Zack shook her hand off his arm. Mom, stop. He's my friend, but why would I push him to attend my little sister's wedding? Why would he even care? Annoyed, he walked out of the room without giving her a chance to respond. She watched him go and turned to see Kelsey's face drop. Don't worry, she said comfortingly. Your brother knows how important tomorrow is. He just hates being told what to do. I'm sure he'll tell Daniel to come. Kelsey pouted, knowing that her mother was just telling her what she wanted to hear. She resented Daniel and his family. She resented how powerful they were, and how the only access her family had to them was through Zack. There are entire corporations that work with us just because he's friends with the Weston, she thought with a scowl. She was willing to bet that he would jump at the chance to bring Daniel to Madison's wedding. She had never understood why Madison was Zack's favorite. Not even Alex was as close to him as Madison. He'd use all his social clout to make her life easier. But he won't even try to help me. Why does all that brotherly love disappear when it comes to me? She brooded. She glared up at the ceiling toward Madison's room, and her anger ran through her like an electrical current. Her hands clenched into fists so tightly she could feel her manicured nails start to dig into the flesh of her palms. I hate her. I hate her more than I've hated anyone in my life. Kelsey mumbled in her head. Her mother was clearly the lady of the house, and Madison wasn't even her daughter. Everything Madison had should have been hers, including Zack's attention and affection. What was so special about Madison that Zack would do anything for her? Kelsey was so angry she couldn't even speak. She just stared at the ceiling, her eyes gleaming with hatred.
Madison flung herself onto her bed and stared at the ceiling. She lay utterly still, and the only sound in the room was that of her breathing. Her mind was racing so fast that she couldn't tell where one thought ended and another began. Oh, Ian, am I a substitute for the woman you intended to marry? Am I a distraction or a diversion from your feelings? No matter what the answer might be, she knew she couldn't accept it. Her cell phone was in her hand, and she wanted so much to make the call, to ask the question, but she didn't have the courage. She could only squeeze it tightly and let the minutes tick by. Night fell, and she hadn't moved. There were so many things that needed thinking about, so many questions that needed answers. Her entire future was in her hands, and she needed to make a decision. Her phone rang, but she wasn't startled by it at all. She didn't even look at the screen when she answered the call. Hello? She said flatly. Madison? Ian sounded tired from his long day in the OR. What are you doing? I'm just lying down. It's been... I was a little worn out when I got back, so I took a nap. She kept her tone as light as she could so he wouldn't ask about what had happened that day. He let out a strange little laugh, followed by a brief pause. I wanted to know if you're doing anything tomorrow. Madison's heart stopped. The next day was Luke and Kelsey's wedding. Would he have forgotten? What's going on? She asked, avoiding his question. I have a few things I need to take care of, he said. She laughed mirthlessly and stared at the ceiling. Ah, well, do what you need to do. I have plans tomorrow. She felt a single tear slide down the side of her face. They chatted awkwardly about nothing for a few more minutes before saying goodnight. After ending the call, Ian frowned at his phone. Once again, he sensed something was wrong, but he had no idea what it could be. Madison woke up early the next morning to find that Kelsey had already left for the Reddington Hotel. It wasn't as fashionable as the Pink Star, but it was famous and had a grand ballroom that was a perfect venue for a wedding. The house was deserted, so she made herself some breakfast before getting dressed. She wore a light pink, knee-length dress with a skirt just full enough to give it a playful bounce and a simple pair of gray pumps. Her hair went up in a deceptively sloppy bun, and she did a self-conscious little twirl in the mirror. Satisfied, she ordered a car and headed out. On the way to the Reddington, she gazed out the window at the city streets passing by. Like most people who live in a busy city, she had seldom taken the time to look around as she went about her day. But she couldn't help but notice that all the billboards along her route were showing the same ad. By chance, her car stopped at a red light near one of the largest, and she was able to study it closely. There was a photograph of a dancer in arabesque, her long, slender form balanced impossibly on the toes of one foot. Her other leg was stretched out behind her in an elegant line, floating effortlessly in space. The dancer wore glittering black tutu and bodice, and her severe makeup and winged headdress identified her as Swan Lake's infamous black swan. She looked angry and sad, and Madison was surprised by how moved she was just by the still image. Bold choice. You'd expect the swan princess to be the draw, Madison thought idly. The black swan wasn't the villain of the piece, but she wasn't a hero, either. She was the kind of character audiences love to hate. Presumably, this company's prima ballerina was dancing Odile instead of Odette, which was the role most dancers coveted. The spirit of ballet returns, she muttered, reading the sign. She found herself counting the billboards once the car started moving again. There was even a huge LCD sign near the hotel with footage of the dancer in motion seemingly floating in air. There were people clustered on the sidewalk in front of the sign, mesmerized by the dancer. It looked like the spirit of ballet had captured the city's attention. The car stopped outside the Reddington, and she took a moment to steal herself for the day ahead. Just keep your head down and go with the flow, she told herself. She knew she would have some tough battles to fight, and she was still confused about Ian, but she was going to try her best to get through it. The wedding had not yet started, but guests had already begun to arrive. Madison made sure to play her role well and chat politely with everyone she came across. 
If nothing else, no one can claim the Greenwald sisters can't get along, she thought ruefully. After a few minutes, she excused herself to the bridal suite, where Kelsey was still getting her makeup done. Since Madison wasn't part of the wedding party, she had no responsibilities, so she sat quietly in a corner and leafed through some old magazines someone had left behind. It was blissfully dull, and she wished she could sit there all day. Kelsey was already in her gown, a complicated and expensive confection of silk and tulle. It wasn't the dress she had originally wanted. Luke had been ready to commission a dress by Cassandra Weston, who had been living abroad, but he lacked the social standing to get an appointment with her. Even Madison thought it was sweet that he wanted to do that for Kelsey. Whatever her misgivings about her family, she was glad Kelsey was important to him. Kelsey watched Madison's reflection in her makeup mirror and felt a swell of suspicion rising in her heart. Why isn't she with Ian? She wondered. Where's your husband, Madison? Kelsey asked. He couldn't make it, Madison said, not looking up from her magazine. Kelsey frowned for a moment, but she shrugged. She couldn't be bothered to care. When her makeup was done, she gathered up the flowing skirts of her gown and nodded. Madison took her cue and went down to the ballroom. It was draped in fresh flowers, filling the room with their sweet scent. At one end of the room, John waited by a set of double doors to walk Kelsey down the aisle. At the other stood Luke, looking nervous in his bespoke tuxedo. She decided to avoid the aisle and walked along the outer edge of the banks of chairs that had been set up. Passing by one of the windows dressed in gauzy muslin, she noticed another Spirit of Ballet billboard on the building across the street. The media team really went all out, she thought, stopping to study the dancer. Normally, she wouldn't have noticed, but since she was in advertising, Madison was keenly aware of how campaigns were run. Whoever was promoting this ballet company had pulled out all the stops to make sure everyone knew this particular dancer's face, whoever she was. She was drawn from her revere by the sound of her name being whispered nearby. Despite herself, she strained to listen in. Here we go. Time to feed the jackals, she thought. That's the oldest Greenwald girl, isn't it? Said a woman in a stage whisper. I heard she'll be having her own wedding soon. Too bad it won't be anything as nice as this. The groom's a doctor, I think. Something like that, said the lady next to her. No wonder she's not married yet. She's supposed to be impossible to be around. She thinks very highly of herself, if you know what I mean. The family must be so embarrassed. Where is this doctor of hers? Maybe he's too ashamed that he can't give her this kind of wedding. I know I wouldn't be able to show my face in public if I had to compete with all this. Madison did her best to ignore them. It's just like the sound of the wind in the trees, she thought. It grated on her, though, that people would say these things at a wedding, especially when they knew she could hear them. There's just no way to win, she mused. Ignore it, and they'll think they've won. Fight it, and they'll just have more to talk about. God, I wish Ian were here. She sighed deeply, already wondering what awful things people would have to say about her the following day. Will it be stories about how sad and bitter poor Madison Greenwald must be that her sister beat her down the aisle? Or will everyone be clucking in sarcastic sympathy for the poor henpecked doctor I've married? Either way, she was just so tired of it all. She was even starting to consider leaving town altogether. Madison was grateful to hear the beginning notes of the wedding march and stood along with the rest of the guests for Kelsey's big entrance. The bride was beaming as she walked toward Luke. Her face was lit up with a kind of coy happiness. Madison thought she looked slightly demented, but squashed the notion before it could show on her face. The other guests' face ranged from bored to giddy, but more than a few were envious. Time seemed to slow as she watched Kelsey float down the aisle. She looked so beautiful. Everything was perfect. The dress, the ring, the flowers, the music. All of it was perfectly curated for her and Luke. Who will my wedding be curated for? She wondered. All the arrangements that had been made were for someone else. She was just taking someone else's place and someone else's wedding to someone else's groom. While Madison was lost in her thoughts, Luke fought to keep his knees from buckling at the altar. 
He watched Kelsey glide toward him, glowing with a pride, and looked around the ballroom at all their guests. His eyes stopped when he saw Madison. He was captivated by the smoothness of her skin, the delicate cupid's bow of her lips, and the light plain of her wide, dark eyes, which were wet with unshed tears. She looked so sad. Was it because she thought I'd be standing here waiting for her? He wondered, watching her closely. He felt a pang of sorrow for the hurt he had caused her, before he noticed that he was staring. He wasn't the only person to notice. He heard someone clear their throat theatrically, and he became aware of a few hushed conversations. He's supposed to be marrying one sister, someone muttered primly, but he can't take his eyes off the other. The whisper was as loud as a gunshot in the hush of the ballroom. It flowed through the room like a wave, until more than half the guests were watching Luke and Madison instead of the bride. There was a cruel little laugh in the back of the room that was quickly stifled, but not quickly enough. Most of the guests had been at both Kelsey's birthday party and her engagement dinner, so they were well aware of the tension between the Greenwald sisters. Madison's behavior during the birthday party had almost passed into urban legend. It had been exaggerated each time it had been passed along the grapevine, and the engagement party had left more than one guest wondering which of them Luke truly loved. No one was talking about it, but everyone knew that Madison and Luke had been a couple for years while they were in college. The Greenwalds had tried to pretend it had never happened, and most of their friends were content to play along but there was no denying that Luke couldn't seem to tear his eyes away from her. Luke's father coughed loudly to snap him out of his trance, but Luke still couldn't look away. It was only when Kelsey had finally reached the altar and stepped heavily on his toe that his spell was broken. He was face to face with his bride and her father, who wore identical expressions. Their eyes were flat and hard, and their smiles were brittle. Sorry, he whispered. I'm a little nervous. It's my first time getting married. The cold fury in John's eyes told him that his little joke hadn't landed. John kissed his daughter's cheek, and with a final glare at Luke, turned to take his seat next to Stella. Luke avoided Kelsey's flinty glare and turned to the minister, who had the good grace to look a little embarrassed, but he had seen far worse throughout his career. He winked at Luke kindly. Dearly beloved, he said. And the ceremony began. Everyone was listening, though. Once again, Madison was submerged in a tide of whispered gossip. The nerve, muttered a woman behind her, marrying one woman while ogling another, and her sister, too. She must have given him some kind of signal, replied another guest. I can try to ruin your sister's wedding just because you're jealous. The older one's husband isn't here. I wonder if he knows about all this. He must know she's a tramp. Why else wouldn't he come to his sister-in-law's wedding? I bet he's at a lawyer's office as we speak, trying to get out of this mess. Another one stated. The blood drained from Madison's face as she listened to the vitriol. She knew from experience that blowing up wouldn't solve anything. So she tried to sit as still as possible and let the ceremony play out. Just tune them out and get through the day. She thought grimly, but she knew that ignoring the rumors wouldn't put them to rest. After the ceremony, the guests all moved to an adjacent hall where the reception was set up. Kelsey had changed from her gown into a white cocktail dress and took her place at the main table at the head of the room for the toasts and speeches. But Madison didn't hear a word. She was trying not to pay attention to the flurry of gossip around her, but she was failing miserably. A conversation from one of the nearby tables was audible. Do you know why her husband didn't come? Asked one of the guests. Would you? If he knows that Luke's still carrying a torch for her, why would he bother? Said another. Still kind of a bold statement, don't you think? Not showing up for such an important event guarantees that's all anyone will talk about. Young people have no idea how to be discreet. Someone commented. The last remarks caused a trickle of cruel laughter. Madison felt sick, but she refused to react. 
One or two kinder guests tried to shush the others, but it didn't do much to quiet them entirely. She was dimly aware that Kelsey and Luke were giving their final toast when she heard her name. Looking up, she saw Kelsey staring at her with a forced smile that seemed more like a grimace. Luke stood beside his wife, his face flushed with embarrassment. And to my big sister, Kelsey was saying, thank you for always being so kind to me. Believe me when I tell you that as soon as I get the chance, I will definitely pay you back. With interest. There was a brief ripple of applause as Kelsey and Madison looked deeply into each other's eyes. Madison hadn't missed the extra edges on the word kind, but everyone else had. Kelsey had always been an expert at pretending to care about her, so outwardly. It was a heartfelt declaration of sisterly love. But Madison knew it was a declaration of something else entirely. She half stood and raised her glass to the happy couple, forcing a smile. Luke looked at her sympathetically and raised his glass as well. He could tell she was in a terrible mood. We're family now, he said, turning his attention from her to the guests. May we all get along, and may we all get what we want. Weakly, Madison raised her glass to her lips. Before she could take a sip, a strong hand wrapped around her waist, and she smelled the familiar scent of musk. She didn't have to turn around to know who was beside her. Sorry I'm late, Ian said in a stage whisper as he plucked the champagne glass from her hand and smiled. Kelsey and Luke stared at him in shock as he downed Madison's champagne and waved at a waiter to bring him another. He wore a custom tux that fit him like a glove and looked as dapper and elegant as a movie star from old Hollywood. Zach, seated on the opposite side of the table, frowned and turned quickly. Recovering quickly, Kelsey smiled. She thought you couldn't make it. Madison's been in such a funk all day. We were all so sad when she told us you weren't coming. Kelsey had skillfully managed to imply that Madison was the cause of the day's friction. She's just convinced everyone that I told Ian not to come so I could spoil her wedding by moping around. Not another chance to make me look like some kind of drama queen. She's good at this, Madison thought. Ian had heard some of the gossip floating around when he arrived, so he made sure to look Luke in the eye. I had a major surgery scheduled, so I told her I wouldn't be able to make it. But there was a hiccup with the patient, so it's been postponed. I rushed over as soon as I could. I would have been sorry to miss this. He laid his hand on Madison's and stroked it with his thumb, setting off a new flurry of murmurs. Madison watched opinion shift yet again as people convinced themselves and each other that she was sensible and solid. She had enforced her dashing husband to come to the wedding because he was out there saving lives. Meanwhile, they started to see Kelsey as slightly petty for harping on her poor big sister. Kelsey's smile froze. I'm... I didn't realize, she stammered. I'm glad you're here. There was an awkward moment of silence, but Luke saved the day by whispering in her ear. She nodded, and they walked through the room together, stopping at each table to greet their guests while dinner was served. Madison decided she couldn't bear the thought of trying to make it through dinner, so she stood and turned to leave. Ian followed her, making sure his face didn't show how annoyed he was. What did I do this time? Okay, I forgot about the wedding. I don't see why she's throwing a temper tantrum about it. She doesn't even like these people. I can't figure out why she cares so much about what they think, he thought. Madison knew Ian was following her, but she didn't turn around. She was trying to decide whether to ask the question that had been on her mind since the night before. There was a part of her that was hoping Zack had been wrong. It was true that he was friends with Ian's older brother, but who knew what secrets the Westons kept? It was all still just hearsay. She slowed her pace until Ian was walking alongside her. He studied her profile and wondered again if he had misjudged her. Is she fearless and smart? Or is she another debutante who needs the approval of others to function? They walked side by side in silence, mere inches from one another. But the distance might as well have been miles. Finally, Madison stopped in her tracks and turned to face him. If you didn't want to be here, why did you come? She asked. She saw the annoyance and frustration in his eyes. 
What's going on? Ian made himself take a deep breath. He had always been proud of his self-control. He was a doctor, a scientist, so he had to be even-tempered and clear-headed at all times. For some reason, though, all that discipline fell apart when it came to Madison. He wasn't even sure why he was angry with her if he was being honest with himself. Whenever he was with her, he found himself blurting out exactly the wrong thing at exactly the wrong time. Madison, you're acting like a child, he said. Do you really think storming out of your sister's wedding was the right play? She reeled as if she had been slapped. The right play, she thought. She stared at him, dumbfounded, and then turned sharply and kept walking. She hated that she thought he might have had a point. Leaving the wedding had been childish and irrational, but she was having trouble controlling her emotions. Whenever she thought about Ian's mystery girlfriend, she felt a stab in her heart. Every time she thought she was close to getting a handle on her marriage, she was thrown another curveball. She forced herself to take a long, deep breath. She knew she had to get a grip on what she was feeling. Ian was older than she was, and he had been reasonably tolerant, but even he would run out of patience eventually. Relationships aren't supposed to be easy, she thought, especially one that started like ours. I know that, but I can't help what I feel. She stopped walking and turned to him again. Before she could say anything, though, he held up a hand. Go back, he said. Think about it. I'll give you a call in a couple of days. I still have that surgery. We'll... we'll talk in two days. He turned and walked away from her without another word. Whatever she had been about to say to him died in her throat and sank to the pit of her stomach. In her room, Madison was curled in a ball under her blankets with Ian's words ringing in her ears. You're acting like a child. We'll talk in two days. Everything he had said was crowding her thoughts. But those two sentences were louder than the others. They hurt her the most. Did you know your family had a whole wedding planned for someone else, Ian? If she came back, would you still want to be with her? She thought. She had been about to ask those questions, but hadn't had the chance. He had cut her off and sent her away without letting her speak. Madison almost didn't hear the knock on her door. She sat up and rubbed her face to make sure it didn't look like she had been crying before opening it. It wouldn't have mattered, though. She already knew only one person could be on the other side. Zack stood in the doorway, looking concerned with his hands in his pockets. Hey, he said softly. Have you decided? She smiled and forced her voice to sound bright and sweet. Don't you worry about me, big brother. I'll handle it myself. I'll talk to him. He just looked at her as if he could read her mind, his dark eyes looking directly into her heart. He reached out and pulled her into his arms, hugging her fiercely. No matter what you choose to do, Mads, he whispered, I need you to remember that I will always be here for you. She buried her face in her brother's chest, and bit her lip to keep from crying. He held her like that for a minute, and then he kissed the top of her head and left, closing the door behind him. Madison sank to the floor and let herself cry so hard that she struggled to breathe. She had thought of Ian as a rainbow, the only real color in her life, and a reminder that things could always get better. But he wasn't her rainbow. He belonged to someone else. When they had met, she had hoped to be the person who lived in his heart, and they would spend the rest of their lives getting to know each other, and that he would look at her one day and see a perfect fit. How would he react when he learns that his breakup might have resulted from a misunderstanding? Worse, if he learns the truth, will he stay with me? She wondered. Madison knew so little about the real world or how it worked. She had never really had any guidance or training since no one bothered with her after Stella had moved in. She knew walking out of Kelsey's reception had been a mistake, but she had been overwhelmed and hadn't seen any other choice. She leaned against the door of her room and cried herself out. On the other side of the door, Zack sat and listened to her sobs, his heart breaking for her. After a troubled sleep, 
Madison spent the next day with her phone practically glued to her hand in case Ian called. When her phone did ring, it was Diana calling to invite her to the Weston house to continue planning the wedding. She rushed over without hesitation, hoping she might see her husband once she got there. He wasn't home, though, so she sat in a daze, only half listening to Diana and Olivia as they talked about table settings and menus. She wanted desperately to ask them if she was really the one they wanted to be making these plans with. Is she the wife they wanted for Ian? But she just couldn't muster up the courage. Despite her promise to Zach, she couldn't even talk herself into calling Ian and having it out. Childish. Am I being childish? I can't seem to work up the nerve to call my husband. So maybe that's all the answer I need, she thought. Madison, are you all right? Seem yourself. Diana had been speaking to her for some time, but Madison had been lost in her thoughts. She and Olivia were looking at her with concern. The wedding date was barreling down on them, and there was still a lot to do. The planning might have been more efficient with some help from the Greenwalds, but the only way they would help was if they knew Ian's true identity. Ian still hadn't told them, so Diana and Olivia had to respect his discretion. Why don't you go upstairs and get some rest, dear? Diana said, seeing that Madison was clearly upset about something. We can pick this up after lunch. Reluctantly, Madison nodded and went upstairs to rest. Instead of going to the guest room, she found herself in Ian's bedroom. It was as neat as she expected, but she also found it cold and austere. She noticed an incongruous splash of color on his desk and examined it. It was a brochure for the Spirit of L.A. with the performance dates listed. She bit her lip thoughtfully, letting her mind spin. I didn't figure Ian for a ballet guy, she thought. On impulse, she pulled her phone from her pocket and nervously composed a text message. Will you come to the ballet with me? She sent Ian the text at once so that she couldn't talk herself out of it later, and she went ahead and booked two tickets online. She was surprised to see how quickly they were selling out. People in town seemed eager to see the company dance, particularly the prima ballerina. There was a link on the site to a couple of press releases and news outlets that mentioned she was a local from one of the old families, but Madison didn't follow them. Instead, she stared numbly at her phone in case Ian replied. The worry that he was still angry with her gnawed at her while she sat on his bed and tried to keep her imagination from running wild. Being so impulsive had made things miserable for her, for Ian, and maybe even his whole family. He's right about one thing. I need to get a handle on my emotions, she thought glumly. Watching her phone like a teddy bear, she fell into a restless sleep and never heard Diana open the door to check on her. The older woman looked at her and sighed. Hold on, girl. This town could use a little shaking up, and I think you're just the woman for the job, she thought. Exhausted, Ian left the OR and leaned against a wall with his eyes closed. He had been a machine lately, taking on extra surgeries or scrubbing in to help other surgeons. Everyone on his rotation could see that he had been in a bad mood and was trying to drown it out by working himself to death. Numbly, he pulled out his phone from his pocket and checked his messages on his way to the locker room. Madison's unread text sat there waiting for him, but he debated reading it. Chastising himself for being dramatic, he opened the message and felt the planet stop spinning. The ballet. The only place in the world where I won't be able to avoid her, he thought. He stared at his phone and grinned. Madison seemed to have a magical ability to create chaos just for him. But he would be lying if he pretended that he wasn't secretly thrilled by it. She's a lot of things, but predictable is not one of them, he mused. Recalling how he had spoken to her at the wedding, his smile faded. He knew he needed to be more honest with her. If they were going to start a life together, she needed to know the truth. He knew all about her past, but she didn't know everything about him. It was time to come clean. The decision felt like a weight being lifted, and he found himself smiling again and started to change out of his scrubs. He was half-dressed when Vivian came in and waited for him to notice her. Can I help you, Dr. Faltis? No, she said nervously. 
I just noticed you've been working non-stop lately. And I thought you might like a little break. Friend gave me two tickets to the ballet, and I thought you might like to join me. She held the tickets up and waggled them at him. Are you talking about the spirit of ballet? Others had mentioned that he enjoyed ballet and other cultural events, but Vivian had assumed it was mostly exaggeration to enhance his already considerable mystique. Um, yes, she said with a smile, stepping close to him, as if he had already accepted her invitation. We'll make an evening of it. He stepped away and pulled on his jacket. Sorry, I'll be seeing it with my wife, he said smiling as he left the locker room. Vivian scowled at the door when it closed behind him. He had been in such a dark mood for the last few days. But today he was calmer and more at ease than she had ever seen him. Would it be that woman? She looked down to see that she had crushed the tickets in her clenched fist. Not a son, she hissed. She would never understand the hold that woman had on Ian, especially after such a short time. Vivian Valtas had been working with Ian for years and knew she would be a far more suitable partner than some flighty little college girl. Madison stood in the doorway of the Westons' home, waiting for Kenneth to bring the car around. She was, once again, lost in thought and was only barely aware of the sound of a car pulling up to the house. Distracted, she looked up to greet the driver and stopped in her tracks, eyes wide with shock. It wasn't Kenneth behind the wheel. Her heart fluttered in her chest as the driver looked deep into her eyes. Neither spoke, but the silence between them was as calm and soothing as the scent of the spring flowers in bloom. They stood there, drinking in the sight of each other. There was no way that they could have known, in this moment of peace, the storm that awaited them. Thank you for listening. Please don't forget subscribe. See you on the next episodes.